Hello, this is your host, Adam Graham, from Pretty Much the Present. And in this video, we'll be bringing you a compilation of old-time radio detective podcasts from 2010. The podcasts are appearing, for the most part, unedited, except for some extraneous or repetitive elements that are being removed because this is a compilation. As I said, these are old, so any websites or offers mentioned may not be valid at the time you're listening unless you find them on our website currently. Now, with that said, here is a week of Old Time Radio Detective podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Box 13. Have any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Well, I want to say a big thank you to everyone. We've got the survey up to 100 responses. I'll mention it occasionally because I still want new people to fill it out. But uh, getting 100 responses is pretty significant. So thanks to everybody uh, for filling that out. And please, if you've not become a fan of the show on Facebook, go to facebook.greatdetectives.net. If you have our app from uh, for your iPod Touch or for your iPhone, I've got good news. Um, your bonus is today, and it features Alan Ladd in the Western Shane. Uh, uh, his Lux Radio Theater performance of Shane. Uh, so you can go ahead and listen to that uh, if you have the app, and that's available from the I, I, iTunes App Store, and you can also click on the link at greatdetectives.net. Um, now, uh, if you'd like to see the movie Shane, um, I do have some good news for you. After a change in affiliate networks, I'm pleased to return to letting you know about Netflix. DVDs build up over time. Most end up watched once, but stored forever. Plus, they're very expensive when purchased new and drop in value. That's why I recommend Netflix. With Netflix, you can watch great shows like ITV's Sherlock Holmes with Jeremy Brett, Columbo and Peter Gunn, right from your computer or Netflix-compatible device, no DVD required. In addition, you can get unlimited DVD rentals for less than half of what a new DVD will cost and access to a library with nearly 100,000 titles. And once you have a title, you watch it and you send it back. No clutter. Save time, save money, and save space. Get Netflix. Go to greatdetectives.net and click on the Netflix banner to start your free two-week trial. And now, on with our show. Today's episode of Box 13 is called Hotbox. So let's listen to it, and then we'll come back. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. Enclosed, you'll find enough money to do what I want you to do. Go to the Mason auction rooms and bid on an old Chinese teakwood box. I must have that box. And if you get it for me, wait for further instructions. If you get it for me, wait for further instructions. Hmm. No address, no signature. Just wait for further instructions. Well, as Bobby Burns would say, the best laid plans of mice and men sometimes go wrong. And Bobby Burns knew what he was talking about. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Hot Box. It doesn't sound very interesting, Mr. Holliday. Uh, you never can tell, Susie. 
Now, suppose this teakwood box contains a million crown jewels, and suppose international jewel thieves are after them, and I get mixed up and... and... Gee, go on, Mr. Holliday. That sounded wonderful. Well, what happens then? Well, and then I... What am I saying? I must be out of my head. Well, well, well I think you should go. Uh, to the auction, I mean. Auctions are very interesting. I went to one once. They're, they're like a gin rummage sale. The gin Susie. That's extra. Oh. Anyway, maybe I'll see what's in that teakwood box. You'll be able to reach me at the Mason auction rooms. Well, right there is where the plans begin to get twisted. I took a wrong turn and landed at the Mason auction rooms after the sale had started. Oh, 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 they just sold the teakwood box. Sold it to a scared-looking little guy. He was about 55, pale, and he kept looking around the room while they wrapped the box for him. It wasn't big, that box. Maybe about the size of a cigar box. But the way the little man hugged it to him when he left, it could have been made of branium. Okay, so I missed the boat. Or, or I mean the box. But I wanted something for my trip across town, so I followed the pale little guy from the room. He looked around and saw me. I raised my hand to signal him, and that did it. He spun it out to the sidewalk like a rabbit. I went after him. I wish I hadn't, because when he saw I meant to follow, he took a couple of wild looks around, and then... Hey, look out! Oh! He ran across the street against the traffic signal and right into the path of a car. Oh, what happened here, anyway? I pushed my way oh, through the crowd that gathered. The little guy was lying on the street. I couldn't help it. He ran right in front of me. He ran against the light. Hey, hey, did anybody see you? Did anybody see you? Yeah, I saw it. It wasn't your fault. No, no, it wasn't my fault. I was trying to stop. I wasn't going fast. I was just going to make the turn. It's... Well... Well, is he hurt bad? The little man looked as though he was badly hurt. Somebody sent for an ambulance, then I... Then I remembered the box. I looked around for it. It was on the street. He didn't have it anymore. I looked over the crowd. Nobody had it. Then I noticed the cab at the hack stand at the curb. And getting into it was a woman with red hair. And under her arm was the package. Before I could push my way back to the crowd, the cab was gone. But I saw its number... Okay, it'd be easy to check and find the driver's name and maybe, maybe ask him a few questions. Well, I waited on the street until the ambulance got there. The intern said it was probably concussion. But that evening, I drove to the Marchmont Apartments. Yeah, that, that was where the driver of the cab said he took the woman. I looked at the names on the mailboxes. Nine apartments in the building. Well, one way to get in was to push all the buttons and wait for the door to click open. I went in, but as I did, I looked out the door. Uh -huh. There was a tail on me. I caught a quick glimpse of a man's face. He hurried past, but not before he gave me a good look. Well, that teakwood box was leading to something. After disturbing seven occupants of seven different apartments and getting seven nasty comments, I rang one buzzer... The name underneath was Ruth Cornwall. Is that you, Tommy? Yes, Ruth. Just a second. Oh. Good evening. Who are you? I'm not the fuller brush man. May I come in? Of course not. Uh, I've come about a teakwood box. Will you please go? Oh, maybe you didn't hear me. I said I've come about the teakwood box, Miss Cornwall. I don't know what you're talking about. And if you don't go, I'll ring for the manager. All right. Ring for him. Well? Is this a joke? I don't know. That depends on you. Well, I... Come in. That's better. Now, who are you? My name's Dan Holliday. Do I know you? No, I... I don't think so. But I know you. Oh, you do? From where? Mm, from this afternoon, when you hopped into a cab with a package that belonged to a little man. Oh. <laughs> if that was supposed to be a careless laugh, you need a lot of rehearsal. Well, what makes you think I'm the person you're looking for? I just managed to catch sight of that beautiful red hair of yours. Really, Mr. Holliday, I thought this was a joke at first, but it's getting a little absurd. Oh, no, wait I, I... think you better go now. All I want is an explanation. What's in that box? What's in that box that makes it so important? Well, if I knew what box you were talking about, maybe I could tell you. Let's quit waltzing, Miss Cornwall. You wouldn't have let me in this apartment if you knew nothing about all this. 
But you were scared enough to let me come in and talk. That makes sense? Why should it? Because I could swear you seem relieved about something. Maybe, maybe you were expecting someone else to come after you. Were you? Of course not. All right, I'll wait. I don't think you will. Oh. Does this make you change your mind? Guns always have a habit of making a man think twice. Just think once, Mr. Holliday, about leaving now. Well, your arguments are stronger than mine, and I... Get out of here quickly. You're getting more company. Get out! Now, let's see. Anyone planning to sneak up on you could do the same as I did. Ring all the buzzers, get in the building, then come up here, but... If you don't leave, I'll... I don't think you will. You're very anxious to have me get out before this company gets up here. And you had better click that front door. You'll get impatient and go away. If, if I give you that box, will you leave? Ah, now we're getting someplace. Okay, you talk me into it. Wait. Here. Here it is. Now get out of here and don't come back. What was in it? Nothing. Now please, will you go? For heaven's sake, please go. You got what you wanted, now leave me alone. Well, look, I... Will you leave me alone if he sees you here? I... All right, Miss Cornwall. And please never come back. Never try to see me again. I don't know what it was, but there was something about Ruth Cornwall that put me in sympathy with her. She needed help, wanted it. But it was as though she didn't dare tell me why. I went down the hall, ducked around a corner, and stopped just long enough to look back and see a man go into her apartment... Went downstairs, out onto the street. Keep walking, bub. Huh? I said keep walking, right up to that alley. Hey, what is this? I think you know. But if you want to play 20 questions, I'll let you ask one. This, give you a hint. Oh, when you pull that gun back, take it easy. I think you've got it caught in my ribs. Now, walk. Far enough. Now what? Give me that box. What box? Ain't you funny? Yeah, I, I do card tricks, too. That's enough. Hand it over. It seems to be my night to play give and take. Okay. That's better. Now, good night, holiday. When the alleyway stopped spinning long enough for me to catch it, I... I stood up on it. I looked at my watch. Closely as I could figure, the character who tattooed my head had put me out for a half an hour. See what you get when you put an ad in the paper advertising for adventure? You get it. With lumps. Well, there was nothing more I could do that night. My head felt like the inside of a bass drum in a band. And all I wanted to do was hit Betty by and let my head rest on a nice, soft pillow. <laughs> Good morning, Sue. Oh. Uh, Mr. Holliday, this man's been waiting for you. Oh, you again. Did you sleep all right, Mr. Holliday? Like a top, I spun. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to do anything, Mr. Holliday? I wish you could, Susie. Mr. Holliday, I know a man who wants to see you right now. Uh-huh. Can I persuade you to come along, do you think? Yes, you seem to have a way about you. Susie. Uh, yes, Mr. Holliday? If I'm not back in three hours, call up the insurance company and get back that last premium I paid in advance. Huh? That's enough. Let's go, Holiday. Here's Holiday, Mr. Conrad. Oh, yes. Uh, please come in. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. Here, take a look. Well, that's the box. But it's empty. So it's empty. What am I supposed to do? Fill it with Easter eggs? Shut your trap, Holiday. Take it easy, Jimmy. Maybe Mr. Holiday will tell us things. Now, Mr. Holiday? Like what? Uh, look, I sent you the letter to bid in this box. I checked. Never mind how I found out who you were. Oh, well, then you should know I didn't get the box at the auction yesterday. I know, but you got it last night, Jim. From whom? Look, that's the way I got it. Empty. What more do you want from me? Information. Who had that box? I... Does it make any difference? You've got it now. I want what is in it. That's the way I got it. Jimmy. Yeah, Mr. Conrad? Did you see anybody take the box yesterday when that man was hit by the car? No. Whoever did got away fast. Uh, 
Uh, but, Holiday, you went to the Marchmont Apartments last night. When you came out, you had the box. And that's as far as it goes? Uh, not quite. Where'd you get it from? Conrad looked hard at me. So he didn't know Ruth Cornwall. I could tell him and put her on the spot. But I didn't want to do that. Not until I found out a bit more. Conrad got up from behind his desk. I don't know what game you're playing, Holiday, but I can tell you this. You won't play long. And I'm telling you, I got the box that way empty. All you have to do then is to tell me who picked up that box at the accident yesterday. Yes? And what if I don't? Uh, Jimmy. Yeah? How hard is Mr. Holiday's head? <laughs> Not very. Go ahead, then. Wait a minute. Uh, hold it, Jimmy. Okay, Holiday? What? Look, you want what was in that box, right? Sure. Then let me go after it. What are you talking about? You didn't go to the auction yourself to bid for the box, which means that you didn't want anybody to see you get it. All right. Whatever was in that box is important to you. But if you beat me up, you'll never find out. You see, I'm the only one who knows who had it. Well, we could go to the March Mart and find out. Sure, sure. But you wouldn't find anybody because... Because there's nobody there now. You're smart, huh? Yeah. Smart. It was a bluff. It had to be. But Conrad was afraid to call it. If he did, he wouldn't get what he wanted, he thought. He stared at me and then... Okay, Holiday. I, uh... I don't know how you found out how important this is, but evidently it did. All right? How much do you want? What makes you think I want anything? Are you kidding? Okay. We'll decide that after I get what you want. Uh, bring the notebook and we'll talk it over. It's a deal. Uh, but uh, you won't be alone, Holiday. You'll have company all the way. Oh, how nice. Jimmy has such a good face. You know, it'll do me a lot of good to be seen with him. Yeah, if you don't come through, it could also do you a lot of harm. And now, back to Hot Box, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I could have wound up the whole thing by telling Conrad about Ruth Cornwall. But I didn't want to drag her in unless she was going to double-cross me. Okay, there had to be a starting point. And for me, it was the hospital where the little guy who had bought the box was taken after his accident. Well, I'm afraid you can't talk with him, Mr. Holliday. As a matter of fact, there was another man here yesterday. And he frightened our patient so badly that he had a relapse. Oh. Doctor... What's your patient's name? Ralph Sanders. Uh, he's an ex-convict. Uh, just got out of prison a few days ago. Oh. Okay, thanks, doctor. Here's my name and phone number. If I can talk with him at any time, please call me, will you? So that was a dead end. Then I got the idea that the people at the auction rooms might be able to help. Here it is, Mr. Holliday. That box was uh, part of lot number 509. What does that mean? Well, lot 509 was in storage here. For a time, we received the money to pay for the storage, and <laughs> then it stopped. How long ago? Oh, it must have been over 60 days. We hold goods that long and then offer them for sale to pay for the storage charges. Mm. How long did you have this lot 509? Mm, well, let me look at the books. Four years. Oh. Do you know the name of the person who owned the goods? Uh, James R. Conlon. Uh, at least that's the name on our books. Did you make any attempt to locate this Conlon after the payments on storage stopped coming in? Yes, we did. But we couldn't. I see. Oh, one more question. Did you advertise this sale? Oh, yes. We're bound to by law. You advertise in the papers? That's right. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Well, there was one place to find out about James R. Conlon. The morgue of the Star Times. And what I found out began to slope the merry-go-round enough to let me see some of the things a little more clearly. Then at my apartment later in the day... Hello? Mr. Holliday? Yes, who's this? This is Dr. Evans, City Hospital. Oh, yes. Uh, Sanders is conscious now. Oh, fine. But I'm afraid... 
afraid that he won't live. And since you were the only person who left his name, I, I thought you'd want to know. Uh, may I see him? Well, you haven't much time. I'll be right there, Doctor. I saw the poor little guy. He was pathetically anxious to talk. He had been Conlon's cellmate in the penitentiary. And Conlon had talked. He had to talk to someone, tell about something he was saving up for when he got out. And it was Sanders he told about a teakwood box and what was in it. Never dreaming he'd die in prison before Sanders got out. Okay. Now it was my turn. I went outside. Hello, Jimmy. Still playing tag with me? What's the idea, Holiday? Oh, I'm full of ideas. But the best one of all is... Let's go to Conrad. Uh, you got that book? Not with me, pretty boy. You want to get your head singed? Look, we're going to Conrad right now. Why, I ought to... You, you ought to, but no... you won't. Now, let's get going. If we stand here one more second, I'll let that notebook loose where it'll do the most good. Or the most harm. And that, big ears, depends on the point of view. Why, I... Okay. Okay, but you're asking for trouble. Fine. Let's go hunt for it, shall we? Hello, Halliday. Glad to see you back. You're an optimist, Conrad. Here, I brought your son back with me. Say hello to Papa, Jimmy. What's this all about? I just got tired of having Jimmy haunt him. Jimmy, has he got it? Yeah. Where is it, Halliday? I know. With you? Oh, no, don't be silly. Jimmy, you let him get it and do a fade out on you. No, no, I didn't. Oh, no, Jimmy was with me all the way and a more gruesome companion no man could ask for. Stop yapping. Okay. A while ago, I talked with a little guy named Ralph Sanders. Sanders? So? He was Conlon's cellmate in prison. Go on. It seems Mr. Conn had a notebook filled with a lot of details that would blow you and your nice bunch right out of the window. Where is it? As if I'd tell you. Now, listen. You found out about the box because Sanders talked. The prison grapevine picked it up and it got to you. You wrote me. Wanted me to bid on the box and get it for you. <laughs> the joke's on you, Conrad, because I didn't have the faintest idea what was in that box before today. How long do you think you'll enjoy this big joke on me? A long, long time. I'm walking out of here right now with no tail on me. Yeah? Uh-huh. Because if I don't show up where I'm supposed to, in exactly one hour, that notebook goes to the police. Uh, listen, uh, you're smart. Uh, we can make a deal. Oh, no. Remember, I'm walking out of here. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Good night, Jimmy. Well, his head's not very hard either, is it? Sure, I walked out all right, but I expected to feel my back pick up a few ounces of lead on the way. I didn't. I was very happy about that. Ah, there was still one more thing to clear up. It was Cornwall. If she had that notebook and Conrad found out about it, then I was out in the cold. I got to the Marchmont apartment as fast as I could because it could be that she was going to do a little business with Conrad herself. I got in, went to her apartment. Yes? Oh, I'm in here. Sorry, I couldn't wait to be invited in. I told you not to come back here. Yes, I know, but I'm back. What do you want? Last night you gave me a box. Now I want what was in it. There was nothing in it. Not even a notebook with some very startling things in it? About a certain Mr. Conrad and his gang? So you found out about this? Yeah, but in finding out, I put myself in a wonderful spot to get acquainted with a mortician. All right, so you know. But what good will it do you? What good will it do you? That's no concern of yours. Oh, yes, it is. Put yourself in my place. Conrad thinks I've got the notebook. He also knows who I am and where I live. Now, when he finds out I don't have the notebook and can't hold it over his head, he's going to get awfully, awfully rough with me. <laughs> and that seems to be your problem, Mr. Holliday. Uh -huh. And you won't give me any help with it. Why should I? Fair question. I'll answer it. Because I don't think you want to see me get killed. Look, 
I can't help you. Do you understand that? I can't help you at all. Where's the book? It's no use. I won't tell you. I won't tell you anything. Anything? Why did you put that on the end? Mr. Holliday, the last time you were here, I was at a disadvantage. Now, our positions have reversed. I think you'll leave now without giving me any more trouble. All right. You ask for it. You'll get it. What do you mean by that? I did a lot of reading today, Miss Conlon. <gasps> no. no. Don't call me that. You don't know that. You, you can't know that. No. No, you can't know that. It was a throw in the dark, but it hit where I wanted no. it to. The clippings on Conlon mentioned something about a daughter. Not much. But enough to give me a hint that Ruth Cornwall and Ruth Conlon were the same. I watched her for a few seconds and then... All right. I'm Ruth Conlon. Are you satisfied now? <laughs> Not quite. What I said before still goes. Do you want me to get killed? No. No, of course not. Then what are you doing with that notebook? Well, I... If I tell you, what will you do? That depends on what you tell me. All right. I'll tell you. My father died in prison. No one knows I'm his daughter. No one. For four years, I've lived under another name, waiting for him to come home, waiting to help him get even with Conrad and the men who sent him to prison. Sure, he could have told things at his trial. He knew he'd been double-crossed, but he wanted to wait. And now? And now I... I don't know. What don't you know? I'm going to get married. You see, I, I didn't count on falling in love at 35. Falling in love with Tommy. Oh. He was the man who came here last night after I, after I left. Yes. I had to get that notebook. Because if someone else got hold of it, all the old scandal would be raked up again. People would find out who I was, that my father died in prison. And Tommy would find out. I see. I waited a long time to get even with Conrad, but now I don't want to because of Tommy. Oh, don't you see? I can't let anyone else have that notebook. I want a chance to live like anyone else, like you or a million other people. Yes, I... I see. So, now what do you do? I... I can't do a thing, Miss Conlon. It's your problem now. Mine. That's right. You can destroy that book and let Conrad go along his merry way. You, you can forget your father. He's dead. Whatever happens to Conrad now won't help him. That's true. But leave us out of it. If you let a man like Conrad go free when you could put him where he belongs, that wouldn't be any good, would it? Oh, please, please stop it. And maybe something you've never thought about, but... What? Someday, someday your Tommy might find out. Oh, no. You've got nothing to be ashamed of. It wasn't you. It was your father. Why don't you start with a clean page? If, if this Tommy's a right guy, he'll understand. Well, Miss Conlon? Hello, Tommy. Darling, I... I want you to come over right away. There's something we've got to talk over. All right, dear. I'll give... ten to one on Tommy, Ruth. of Notorious Racketeer after five years. Dead Man's Notebook... Forget that, Susie. Turn to the society page. Oh, Here. Now, read that. Mr. and Mrs. Tommy Gibson leave for Bahamas on honeymoon. Gee, the Bahamas. You must feel just like stupid, Mr. Holliday. The word is Cupid, Susie. And I'm dressed differently. Mr. Holliday. <laughs> Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. 
Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. All right, welcome back. You know, if this episode were just one late, uh, one episode later in the chronology, it would air with next week's Johnny Madero, which is also an episode about an auction. Um, Johnny Madero doesn't quite have um, Dan Holliday's sensitivity, but it'd be an interesting con- um, um, contrast. Um, and that reminds me, Johnny Madero is coming to you tomorrow. Uh, so it's the premiere of Johnny Madero as for our two weeks of Johnny Madero before we get into Jeff Regan. So be sure to listen for that. Um, also, I know uh, I've kind of made the assumption that everyone knows about our other podcast, but I know we've gotten some new listeners who may not have heard of uh, other podcasts that we offer for Old Time Radio. Uh, there's also an Old Time Dragnet podcast. Uh, where we go through the Dragnet shows from the first uh, first available episode to the final bow. We're kind of in the middle, um, um, a pr- about a little bit past the halfway par- point on that series. Uh, but you can subscribe, uh, just put Old Time Dragnet in, or go to RadioDragnet.com. And also there's an Old Time Radio Superman show. Go to LaserAndSword.com uh, for more information on that. Just needed a smart operator like, uh, well, no, Johnny Madero was on the Sam. Hmm? And that's Sam Spade welcoming us to a new series, Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the series in a moment. Uh, I do want to encourage you to please, uh, if you have any comments, send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Um, and uh, you can uh, cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. Thanks for all your support in February. Please uh, remember to cast your vote in March. That's podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash radiodetectives. Johnny Madero was a clone of Pat Novak for Hire, uh, more or less. In fact, it was much more a clone of Pat Novak for Hire when it first aired in its um, now lost first episode. In that episode, the opening sounded just like Pat Novak's. Um, and uh, uh, Johnny's uh, sidekick was named Dipso. ABC took exception to this as they were still running Pat Novak down in San Francisco with Ben Morris. They filed a lawsuit and uh, it was settled between ABC and Mutual, with Mutual agreeing to get rid of uh, Dipso and to change the opening. This didn't really satisfy ABC, but they were willing to forget about their lawsuit um, so that they could go back to just making radio. The show with uh, Johnny Madero, if anything, features more similes flying fast um, than Pat Novak did. And... Uh, uh, it star, uh, co-stars William Conrad as Inspector Warcheck. Conrad, of course, in his pre-Gunsmoke days here. And Gail Gordon plays Father Leahy. Uh, Gail Gordon also stars in the case book of Gregory Hood. The show is generally not considered to be uh, as good as Novak, but there are two episodes in existence, and it'll make an interesting couple weeks listening. Before we start into today's show... Uh, I do want to briefly let you know about a product that's offered on our website at greatdetectives.net. I mentioned Netflix yesterday, and for most of your DVD needs, that's a pretty good way to go. Um, However, there's a movie that's not yet on uh, general DVD uh, release, and that's Dragnet 1954. If you like Pat Novak, uh, that movie, Dragnet, was written... Uh, by Richard Breen, who wrote Pat Novak. Universal Studios, which has released this uh, as a DVD on demand, has the prints of the original uh, 1950s Dragnet shows. I I encourage everybody to go to greatdetectives.net, click on the link to purchase Dragnet 1954, and show Universal what people would really like to see, the 1950s Dragnet made more widely available by Universal Stop. Uh, not sitting on the uh, 
uh, prints of the uh, 1950s TV show. So go to greatdetectives.net, purchase Dragnet 1954. All right, well, we're going to get into today's episode of Johnny Madero. This one uh, is commonly called Pete Sutro. I like another one of the names of the show, but we'll talk about that when we get back. Let's go ahead and listen to Pete Sutro. Johnny Madero, Pier 23. You know, the only time San Francisco really gets hot is when a tourist calls it Frisco, and then it gets warm enough to give a sleigh dog a southern accent. Down around the waterfront, they don't care so much. And for a buck, you can insult anybody but Joe DiMaggio. The piers stretch out like a big yawn from south of the ferry building clear to the China docks. You pushed over on one side so you won't notice about the same spot you'll find dust in a bride's parlor. You find Pier 23. From there, it's a short skip to Johnny Madero's boat shop. My place. The sign outside looks honest, but down here, the only sign people pay any attention to is rigor mortis. I rent boats and do anything else you can blame on your environment. It works out all right. But pretty soon word gets around and you've got a reputation. It doesn't pay to argue because even if you're leveling, you make as much headway as a whistler with a split lip. I found that out last Wednesday afternoon. I was looking out the window watching the tide come in when somebody in back of me coughed. When I turned, Nat Friendly was standing there in the office. He didn't say anything for a minute, and you noticed his eyes were as soft as the inside of a woman's arm. I had one of those faraway looks you couldn't follow with a road map. And then I saw the rest of him. He wasn't flabby, but he was on the way. And you got the idea he was an ex-fighter who settled down with a restaurant. I, uh... I got the right place, haven't I? If a woman screams, you haven't. What's on your mind? <laughs> that's a good question, Nadeau. That's a good question. Uh, that's what I want you to find out. Look, fella, maybe I don't even want to be friendly. What's on your mind? I don't know, Nadeau. I don't know. All right, you convinced me. Now back out of here and we'll both be in the dark. Huh? Oh, wait a minute, Nadeau. Listen to me. Uh, my name is uh, Nat Finley. My wife and I live up on Knob Hill, and I've been retired for a while, see? And... I don't, but go ahead. Well, you got to help me, Nadeau. I'll pay you 50 bucks a day to help me. At that price, it won't be help. I want you to find someone for me. But I don't know who or why, yet. We're back to that again, huh? Oh, listen to me. Lately, a name's been ringing in my ears. Just a name. Pete Sucho. Pete Sucho. Over and over again. So you read it somewhere. I don't know where I picked it up. For the last week, the name Pete Sucho has been on my mind. It's a, it's a nightmare. You've got to do something about it, Nadell. Change your diet. That might help. I want you to find Pete Sucho. Find out who he is, where he is, why he's bothering me. If you do, I'll, I'll give you a $200 bonus. Look, Finley, is this a job or a career? There must be a dozen sutros from here to Jersey City. Maybe, but the Pete Sutro I want lives right here in this town. He's got to. There's a law? Well, listen to me, man. Oh, last night, I, I kept hearing the name Sutro again. Only this time, there was an address, too. It was care of General Delivery, San Francisco. So he's got to be somewhere in this town. Why don't you check the phone book? I have, and the city directory, too. But so far, I haven't been able to locate him. And I will, huh? Well, if you don't, you're still getting 50 bucks a day. What are you worried about? That 50 bucks a day? It might turn out to be a dream, too. You better throw in some advance money. Well, sure, Mattel. I brought a check along, just in case. Will $100 cover your doubts? Yeah, if the bank can cover your check. If they can't, you don't have to do the job. That's fair enough? Mm-hmm. Will you, will you start looking right away? Yeah. But you've got to be careful, Mattel. My wife's never to know about this, understand? Why? Because, well, she, uh, she doesn't like the idea. She... She thinks I'm a little crazy looking for a name like this. She hates me, I think. She thinks I'm crazy. Don't worry about her, Finley, until she starts mixing your nightcaps. For 50 bucks a day, I'll chase anybody's dream. Because with that kind of dough, you're rich enough to run down a couple of your own. When Finley left, I called the bank and found out his check had solid backing. So I went down to Lofty's and I put out some feelers on Pete Sutro. It didn't take long before one of the boys came up with a lead. A couple of other people were looking for Sutro, too. One was a guy named Marty Kane. The other was a torch singer named Evelyn Day. The word was that Sutro and Evelyn used to trade mash notes in Detroit. Well, I phoned the Jade Club where Evelyn was working, but she wasn't due for an hour. So I decided to give Marty Kane the first try. He was living in a motel out in the marina, so I went out. There was a sign outside that said Modern Cabins, but you knew Abe Lincoln did better in Illinois. The cabins were the size of an upper berth with enough holes to start a punch board. That didn't leave much privacy. You had more chance of keeping a secret from Matta Harry. I asked the manager where Kane's place was and he pointed to the end cabin. I went over and knocked on the door. Kane opened it and glared. 
His eyes were the color of Saturday night on a week old jag, and he was so chunky you figured he'd be harder to move than an ice box through a basement window. Who are you? My name's Madero, Johnny Madero. Don't rhyme with anything. What are you looking for? A guy named Pete Sutro. I hear you got the same idea. So you got ears. I'll invite you in. Well, I can't turn you down. Yeah, that's what everybody says about this gun. Now sit down, you get me nervous. Put away the gun and we'll both be calm, huh? After you tell me what you know about Sutro. I'm tracking down a dream. Yours? A client's. You sound anxious. What's your pitch? A wild one. Just say he owes me some dough and I need it bad now. You got the muscles? Take in laundry. I'll put you through the ringer first. I want to lead on Sutro. Yeah, we both do, but I'm not going down on my knees. Oh. Get up, Mazzaro. I don't want to make a liar out of you again. Yeah, you're tough, King. I'll bet you got your dandruff scared stiff. Yeah, and I'll start on yours now. What's Sutro to you? Fifty bucks a day. A guy named Nat Finley hired me to track him down. Does that make you happy? No, just ambitious. Who's Nat Finley? He came in and paid me to find Sutro. He said the name was giving him nightmares. Sounds like a bedtime story, Madero. Well, if you don't like it, jazz it up. It's the truth. I read the wrong papers. Give me another version. All right, if you don't believe me, Kane, make up your own. Here's Finley's check. Can you read? If you'll help me with the big words. Give it here. Nat Finley. Yeah, Nat Finley. You weren't lying. Looks like a good check. I'll take a chance. I'll cash it for you. It's giving you IDs, huh? Yeah, and the first one's about you. Well, here's your dough, Madero. Now get out. Get out quick. Oh, you're too good to me, King. Suppose the check bounces. It won't, Madero, because I ain't going to cash it. Oh, I couldn't figure it. Kane looked at the check and smiled like a guy who just learned all about the atom bomb. I walked out, and the only thing I knew for sure was the demand for Pete Sutra was big enough to start a business boom. I headed back to my apartment to see how much lip I could bring down with an ice bag and a little pressure. When I got there, the door was open and the light was on. Inside, things looked even brighter. The brunette was draped over the couch like she paid the first installment on it. It was about 25 with a pair of legs that would have made a silkworm turn over and write a fan letter. She wore a tan business suit, and the way it was rumpled up, you knew office hours were over. When she saw me, she began to vibrate like an alarm clock at 6 in the morning. Good evening. I won't argue, but you got the wrong room. Will I regret it? I don't know you that well. Oh, you'll catch up with the crowd. My name is Sheila. I'm Nat Finley's wife. You should be somebody's wife. It cuts down on the risk. I want to talk to you. Go ahead. I'll try not to stare. Let's have a drink first, Mr. Madero. Maybe it will cloud your vision. Yeah, and the issue, too, huh? Mm. You serve strong stuff, Mr. Madero. Soda? I'm all charged up now, lady. What's on your mind? I have a problem. Maybe you can help me. Maybe it's too late. I'm listening. It's about my husband, Matt. He tries, but he can't hide much from me. Now that you have the same trouble. Look, lady, you're working too hard for a sale. If you've got a point, make it. All right, Mr. Madero, we'll skip the intermission. My husband saw you tonight and sold you a wild story. Yeah, but it paid off. So far, I'm not complaining. But I am. I want you to drop the whole silly job Nat gave you. You're not building a case. Fifty bucks a day buys a lot of hangover, lady. You don't understand, Mr. Madero. My husband is a sick man. Yeah, I know. He can't sleep at night. He has a large imagination, and it's been getting worse lately. He, um, dreams up things. Sometimes I think... Sometimes I think he's a little crazy. Maybe it's a hobby. He can afford it. There are some things even he can't afford. Yeah, like finding Pete Sutro. That's right, Mr. Madero. There is no such man. Hmm. A guy named Marty Kane will give you odds. Who did you say? Marty Kane. He cashed in your husband's check, you know? No. No, I never heard of him. You don't sound so sure. Marty was talking about Sutro. All right, Mr. Madero. I'm talking about something else now. Money. So far, you're whispering. Shouting, Mr. Madero. Five hundred bucks worth. I'll give you five hundred dollars to drop the job and forget everything. Mm. All right, baby. You twisted my arm. You, um... Uh, you won't let me down, Mr. Madero. Will you? If I do, it'll be nice and easy. Finley had the kind of a wife you mate with a panther. She picked up her purse and peeled off 500 fish. She wasn't talking anymore, and when she swayed out, she wondered how much night practice she'd given that rumba. Well, I was all washed up with the Finleys. It felt good already. So did the dough. I felt like a guy whose name was just picked in a chain letter. My mind was free for the better things in life. So I called up a girl out on Van Ness and told her to meet me at the Regent Bowling Alley. I got there before she did, so I started warming up the alley. A few minutes later, it got a lot warmer because Inspector Warcheck of San Francisco Homicide began spoiling my game. Hello, Madero. 
a nice strike. You're in the wrong kind of alley, Warchick. What do you want? Some pointers? You got time? No. I can see how you hold a bowling ball. Now show me how you hold a gun, huh? All right, Warchick. What's on your mind? I was on Marty Kane's. A guy named Pete Sutro. He owed Kane some money. And you paid off? I paid him a visit. We had something in common. And you must have bored him to death. Kane couldn't quite stand a couple of slugs in his forehead, so he quit. Well, what do you want me to do, Warchick? Break the news to his wife? No. Just tell me about the argument you had. It was a monologue. Kane wanted to know where Sutro was hiding. I only knew one answer, so he did all the talking. Oh, you should have said please. It's not polite to interrupt a guy with a gun. Look, Warchick, what makes me the blue plate special? The motel manager. He said you go into Kane's room, and then he heard a struggle, and then later on he heard a shot. Did he hear who won the fourth? Listen, copper, a guy named Nat Finley hired me to find out who Pete Sutro was. The name was playing tag in his brain all week, and he wanted to know why. Yeah, does that sound like a story? Check with Finley. He's the guy who made it up. What if he lets you down? And work on his wife. She's not bad looking, and she paid me to drop Finley's account. I'll check both your alibis, Manero. In the meantime, I want to line you up. While you're making the rounds, look up a gal named Evelyn Day. She knew Sutro, too. Go ahead. Run the police force. Tell me what to ask her. Forget it, Warchick. You're not the type. Warchick stood there for a second, wiping his teeth with his tongue. If he'd done it on the outside, it would have been a contract job. And then one of the bowlers in a tight pair of slacks brushed up against him and went out. He looked at me once more and headed after her. Well, I didn't feel much like bowling either, so I left a note at the desk for the girlfriend and started out. I knew I was in trouble. Some days it's harder to duck trouble than a handful of pebbles. Oh, I told myself I didn't kill Kane, but that was like trying to fight a fire with an anti-smoke law. The big question was Pete Sutro. Who was he? There were other questions. Like, why did the Finley dame buy me off? And why did her husband want Sutro in the first place? Well, there were no answers, and I felt about as safe as an alligator walking through a handbag factory, so I looked up the only good guy I know, a waterfront priest named Father Leahy. I found him in his room, flipping through a couple of raffle books. Hello, Johnny. You're just in time to buy a ticket. The boys' club is raffling off an electric toaster. I'm already a little burned, Father. I'm in a spot, Johnny. The boys gave me a quota to fill, and I got stuck at a banker's luncheon all afternoon. You know what they're like on risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to sell some tickets. All right, I'll buy a couple, but I need your help. I'm in trouble. You'd better buy five. At a time like this, both of us can afford to be generous. What kind of trouble? This won't take long, Father. You always say that, but it adds up. You don't realize it, but I lose whole weekends that way. Will you please listen, Father? Warchick wants to pin me down on a murder. You've got the weight. Who's dead? A guy named Marty King. I saw him a couple of hours ago, and he was still alive when I left. Can you prove it? Well, that's going to be tough. The clerk at the motel saw me go into Kane's room just before he got tumbled. So far, you don't have a way out. Why not plead insanity? I would, but I'm afraid of the competition. What do you mean? A muddled-up guy named Nat Finley hired me to chase down the name Pete Sutro. He claimed the name was haunting him. I know how he feels. Johnny, I don't think the bishop likes me either. My only lead was Marty Kane. He seemed to want Sutro worse than I did. Sutro is certainly popular for a dream. Do you think he'll ever materialize? I don't know, but I don't think Marty Keene was killed over a dream. If he was, it must have been quite a nightmare. Did you look up your client again? I didn't have the time. His wife paid me to drop the whole job. She said Finley was a harmless duck with a pail full of wild ideas. Does the husband feel the same way about his wife? Do you want gossip, Father, or do you want to help me? That's an unfair question, Johnny. Either way, I'm embarrassed. Please, Father. Will you check up on a few people for me? Yes, yes. Look up Kane's friends, and if you run out of those, try his enemies. Find out who might have had an urge to kill him, will you? It's a tall order, Johnny. There may be a lot of people involved. I can use them all, Father. I know. But can they all use an electric toaster? When I left Father Leahy, I knew I still had one base to tag. It was Sutro's ex-flame, a doll named Evelyn Day. I drove down to Eddy Street and I parked near the Jade Club. Well, it's not a bad place, but on a slow night, even the winos are afraid to go in. Inside, it was dark enough to hide the decimal point on a check, and over by the bar, there was a piano playing music that nobody was listening to. And then Evelyn came out. And right off, he started hunting for the nearest fire exit. She had red hair about this side of 98 degrees, and she wore a black evening gown that held up by one strap and a prayer. She was the kind of a girl who could wear a Mother Hubbard and make it look like a negligee. And when she sang, it came out low enough to strike oil. After she was through, I asked the bartender to give her a message. She walked over to me, and she wasn't happy one way or the other. 
Are you the man who wanted me? One of them. You're Evelyn, huh? Yeah. What'll it lead to? A crisis if you don't sit down. All right. You've got me interested. Now, what's on your mind that we can talk about? My name's Madero. Now, let's start with a friend named Pete Sutro. Let's continue. What do you want to know about him? Where is he? Are you a cop or will you pay for the right answer? I need too many of them, baby. I'm way out ahead in a murder derby and I'll pitch homicide anybody I can get. What do you want Sutro for? I think he shot Marty King. Someone should have. But you're betting on the wrong horse. You're prejudiced. Sutro was your boyfriend. That's right. He was my boyfriend. But I haven't seen him lately. All right, then. What was the last thing you did with him? <laughs> I'll read my diary to you someday. Now, look, baby, you've got a choice. I'm going to rough you up or let the pros do it. Let go of my arm, Adero. Or I'll call a bouncer. Call Sutro. Now, start talking before I bruise you up good. Slow down, Adero. You're out of my weight class. Yeah. I'll tell you what you want to know. Should I take notes or is this going to be quick? I don't know. Depends on how sentimental I get. That's all right. I got a handkerchief. Okay, I'll tell you. I used to be Pete Sutro's girl in Detroit. Then one day he skipped out and left me hanging on the vine. Don't worry, baby. You haven't with it yet. I started looking for him and so did Kane. Why Kane? He and Pete had a deal together. Pete ran out with all the dough. Your boy should have run for Congress. He's got a nice record. What kind of a deal did he have with Kane? I don't remember. All of a sudden, huh? I'm shy when it comes to strangers. Let's just end it by saying Pete disappeared. Let's say you're dummying up. I love Pete. And I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Do you carry a picture with that torch, baby? Sure. Want to see? Here's a snapshot of Pete in my locket. Do you know him? Not this season, no. I want him back. He was a good guy. Yeah, your boy worked up a lot of people. He made number one nightmare for a guy named Nat Finley. I heard. And I want to see Finley, too. You saw me, miss. But I want to talk to Madero. Hello, Finley. I got to see you alone, Madero. And I got to see you now. You lost your option. I'm freelancing again. Well, you can't walk out on me. This is going to hurt, fellow. Your wife paid me to drop the job. That's what I got to talk to you about, Madero. I think she wants to drop me, too. <laughs> Finley grabbed me by the arm, and you could tell he was scared. His jaw was shut tighter than a wall safe, and his Adam's apple rode up and down like a yo-yo. Evelyn wanted to compare notes with him on Sutro, but right now Finley was as friendly as a no-limit poker game. He hustled me out of the jade and into a waiting cab. He wouldn't say anything because of the driver. So he sat in one corner, rubbing his hands and looking straight ahead. When we got to the office, Finley paid the bill, and we went up the ramp. Inside, he had a little trouble getting started, like a big family leaving on a picnic. And then he got his voice. I'm in a bad spot, Madero. I need help. Have you tried classified? I'm trying you. I tell you, my wife's out to get me. She keeps telling me I'm crazy. She's trying to talk me into it. A lot of wives feel that way, Finley. She'll get over it. Yeah? Well, well I, Madero, she's trying to send me to an asylum. She and Sucho. you got enough worries to start a peace conference. What brings Sucho back into the headlines? I, uh, I found a letter in Sheila's purse. Kane wanted $10,000 from Sheila to keep quiet about Sucho. All right, quit crowding me with ghosts. So your wife had a past. And she and Sucho have a future unless... Unless you help me. Help me, I tell you. I tell you, Sutro's behind the whole thing. He and my wife must know each other, and they're trying to get rid of me. You're getting a complex, Finley. Slow down. Well, you've got to help me. Well, who's going to help me? i got a murder rap to beat. Well, but I'll clear you, Madeira. I'll clear you if you help me now. You couldn't clear your own throat in an empty tunnel. What makes you eight feet tall? This gun in my hand. Well, stop pointing it, fella. You're too nervous to aim. Well, you don't understand, Madeira. I'm not pointing it at you. I'm giving it to you. This is the gun that killed Cain. You were there when it happened? No, but either my wife or Sutro was. When did you dream that up? An hour ago. I found it in my wife's closet. Two slugs are missing, and I, I got a feeling it killed Kane. Send it to homicide. They'll let you know who did it by return mail. I can't, Madero. I can't just yet. I don't know whether Sheila or Sutro did it. I got a feeling inside. You've got to find Sutro, or you'll end up killing me yet. That's a prediction? Wait a minute. Someone's coming down the hall. Hide the gun, Madero. They're after me now. Yeah. They got the light to Lay low. They're aiming for something bigger. What are you going to do, Madero? Just waiting for something to happen. Ooh. Madero. Madero. I guess it happened. Somebody turned a flashlight in my eyes and then hit a four-bagger. If they hung around, they could have seen me do a couple of quick quivers a chorus girl would have been proud of. I laid there in the dark for a while. If you're going to look messy, a blackout isn't a bad place to do it. After a while, I tried to get up, but my stomach felt as empty as a horse laugh at a funeral. I sprawled out again, and I tried to figure how a name like Pete Sutro could start so much pain. Then the lights went on. 
They should have stayed off because Warchick was breathing over me like a steam engine with a broken heart. Hello, Madero. Does the light bother your eyes? Yeah, Warchick. Get out of it. And get used to it. It's a lot stronger down at headquarters. Uh, tell me about the gun on the floor. I heard you were coming. I wanted to commit suicide. You didn't try hard enough. Just got a phone tip that said you had the gun that killed Marty Kane. Hand it to me. All right, copper. I'll make it easy for you. Finley left the gun here before somebody sapped me. Uh-huh. Who's somebody? Don't any of your friends have names? Sure. Check with Finley. He was here when it happened. It was dark, Madero. How did he see? With an electric eye? I don't know. Maybe he smelled his wife's perfume. Look her up, too. She's that interesting, huh? Kane used to think so. What do you mean? It was blackmailing her. Look, Madero, a grocery list is blackmail to you. I'll put you on the inside. Finley found a letter in her purse. Kane wanted ten grand to keep quiet about Sutro. Finley told you all about it, huh? He can't keep a family secret. And the wife tumbled Kane to keep him quiet. Is that the idea? Well, this is your good day, Warcheck. Find Sutro now, and you've licked the whole thing. No, you find him, Madero, and we'll give you a reward. You're too generous. What's the pitch? Sutro's wanted for a payroll robbery in Detroit. He's been out of sight for a year now. He hasn't been out of mind, though. Finley thinks his wife is carrying on a sideline with him. Look, Madero, I talked to your boy, Finley. He's got enough dreams to start a mattress factory. I don't believe him. I don't believe you. You don't believe the world is round. Take stock, Warchick, and start learning. Yeah, I will. I will. Let's see how much the fingerprints on this gun teach me. If you've got a story, I'll stay after school. You'll still wear the dunce cap. That's all right, Madero. There'll be a badge on it. Warchek wrapped the gun up in a handkerchief, and if it killed Marty Kane, I might as well start writing letters to the governor. The gun was a plant, but I had about as much chance of selling that to Warchek as a pair of short pants to a reform school. Warchek stood there and smiled, and then he walked out. Ah, oh, there were a lot of questions again, like who sapped me, and did Finley really have a story? The more I thought about it, the more snarled it got, and then the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Johnny. This is Father Leahy. Are you still free? Yeah, but I'm breathing hard. How'd you make out? Fine, Johnny. I sold ten raffle tickets. What'd you find out? Warcheck just got a teletype. Sutro pulled a payroll robbery in Detroit. They think Marty Kane helped him. Well, that figures. What else? Sutro and the Doe are supposed to be somewhere in town. Yeah, even the bloodhounds are worried. How does Sheila figure? She and a girl named Evelyn were both in love with Sutro. But rumor has it that Sutro's favorite was Evelyn. What about Finley? Sheila must have got tired of sharecropping, so she settled for Finley. They both came in from Detroit about a year ago. But, Father, it's still fuzzy. Marty Kane was blackmailing Sheila because of Sutra. There must be a tie. Evelyn's asking the same question, and she thinks Sheila knows the answers. She's on her way to the Finley place for a showdown. Thanks, Father. I'll tag along and grab a seat on the sidelines. It'll be a free-for-all if those two girls tangle. Don't worry, Father. They won't get in my hair. Don't be too sure. Samson had trouble with one girl. <laughs> Father Leahy hung up. All the pieces began to fall into place. All but one. Where was Sutro? He was around somewhere, but it was like throwing a headlock on a shadow. I grabbed a cab out to the Stafford Arms, and when I got there, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up an orphan. I took the elevator and got off on the sixth floor. And then I leaned on the doorbell, and Sheila answered. She was wearing a pair of rose-colored lounging pajamas, and I've seen baked potatoes with lucid jackets. She must have been surprised, but she didn't blink an eyelash. Are you pausing or opposing, Mr. Madero? I'm looking for trap doors. Oh, I thought you're going to look that way. Come inside. Yeah. Now bring that gleam in your eye over to the fireplace. We'll warm it up a little. It won't look good in company. Why? Who's company? Evelyn's a little late. She got tied up sharpening her claws. Evelyn who? Hold out, baby. She's got a better question than that. Like what? Like Forest Pete Sutro. The key sounds like a friend. It's too early. That's probably my husband, Matt. Oh, hello, Madero. I'm glad you're here. Somebody's been following me. Oh, you're dreaming again, darling. You see? What did I tell you? It wasn't a dream. That must be her. Hello, Sheila. Remember me? You, you must have the wrong place, lady. That's the right idea. I want Pete Sutro back. You want too much. I'll grab anyway. I've come for Pete, Sheila. You came too late. He's dead. Pete Sutro died two years ago in Detroit. You hear me? He's dead. Not dead enough. You're lying, Sheila. Pete Sutro is standing right behind you. What do you mean? That's my husband. That's Matt. 
So you gave him another name and another face. But you can't give him another voice. That's Pete Sutro. What are you talking about? What are you saying? I'm not Pete Sutro. Don't you remember me, Pete? I'm Evelyn. Oh, what did they do to your face, darling? My face? I, I was in an accident. It, it's, it's hard to remember things. Remember the payroll robbery, Pete? You were supposed to come back to me. Payroll robbery? Yeah, it was an accident. And I, I was hurt. I, I can't remember anything else. It, it's so hard to think. Well, you, you were there, Sheila. What happened? Go ahead, Sheila. Tell him what happened. Tell him that he's Pete S- Sutro. Tell him that you stole him from me. Tell him that you killed Marty Kane. All right, Evelyn. I'll tell it to you first. It was a good campaign, but I'm voting you down. Put away now. the gun. He won't stand he for it. He can pick now. What are you doing, Sheila? You'll hurt him. I'll try. <laughs> you, you shot him. You shot. Evelyn. See? You remember me? She. She broke us up. For good. But you. You remember me? Yeah. Yeah. I remembered. Evelyn. I'm beginning to remember a lot of things now. Then forget them, Ned. Just you and me now. We're married. You are. You married a guy named Nat Finley. Stay away from me, Nat. Nat! Try Pete. See how it sounds. Let... Give me the gun, baby. You killed Evelyn. Let go. You didn't need her. Not anymore. I got the gun now. No, please, Nat. Please. Tell me it's a dream, baby. Tell me I'm crazy. You are, Nat. You are. I am getting out of here. You're not quick enough. Ah! The gun's empty now. Yeah. So is everything. I'm tired, Nadeau. Tired. Hold out. It's going to be a long trip. Yeah. I told you, Nadeau. Pete Sutro was going to kill me in the end. Yeah. You talked yourself into it. Warchak got the whole story the next morning. Seems that Sutro and Kane were in a big robbery in Detroit. The plan was for Sutro to carry all the dough and meet Kane and Evelyn at their hideout. But Sutro got smashed up in an auto accident and never made it. Sutro's face had to be remodeled, and when he lost his memory, Sheila made her pitch. She promoted a wedding and cut herself in on half the stolen cash. Changed his name to Nat Finley and brought him out to San Francisco. Kane and Evelyn got wind that Sutro had taken off to the coast, so they followed they couldn't find him, and for a year, Sheila and Sutro got along without a hitch. And then Sutro began hearing his real name in his own mind, and before Sheila could do anything, I'd already shown her husband's check to Kane. He recognized Sutro's handwriting right away, and so he started to blackmail Sheila. He didn't make any yardage because Sheila stopped him with a thirty-eight, And then she tried to convince her husband that he was crazy. Evelyn won in the last round when she recognized Sutro's voice at the jade. It turned out that Sutro had been chasing himself until he caught himself. Well, Warcheck asked only one question. How can a guy forget his own name? I don't know. A lot of hotels would like to know that, too. Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb as Johnny Madero, has been presented by the Mutual Network. Johnny Madero is written by Herb Margulis and Lou Morheim. Gail Gordon played Father Leahy. Bill Conrad played Inspector Warcheck of Homicide. John Garfield Platt played Nat Finley. Others in the cast were Gene Rogers, Joan Banks. Original music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the entire production was directed by Nat Wolf. Tony Lafrano. This speaks. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, this episode was also known as The Man Who Chased Himself. Uh, and this is probably one of the most clever mysteries of the Pat Novak, uh, Johnny Madero episodes out there. So, it was definitely a good job. And I loved all of, um, all of, uh, uh Madero, Madero's lines. Oh, the expertly delivered. Uh, inc- um, and incredibly hilarious. We, I definitely missed, um, 
Jocko in this episode. I, I don't think Father Leahy was a was a good a, was a good replacement. But uh, we'll talk a bit, little bit more about that next week. Of course, in two weeks we'll be switching over to Jeff Regan. We have a couple Facebook comments and uh, also an email, but we're going to save that for after the show. Uh, before we get started, I do want to um, encourage you uh, to please remember, uh, as you make your travel plans, to fly johnnydollarair.com, which is Priceline. Uh, Priceline has helped to revolutionize travel by putting consumers in the driver's seat. Uh, you can either name your own price or choose from uh, many published fares. So just remember, johnnydollarair.com, johnnydollarair.com. And now we'll get into today's show. Uh, this week's episode of Let George Do It is called A Close Call. So let's go ahead and listen, and then we'll come back. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're cornered and need confidential help, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, I've loved a man now for many years, a hopeless love. Because, you see, I'm his wife's best friend. He says we must be together at all costs. And I know that would almost certainly mean her death. I couldn't build any kind of happiness on that. I have an answer, but I need your help to carry it out. I need your help to carry it out. Could you be at my apartment tomorrow morning? Signed, Joyce Dunning. Husband, wife, best friend. The time-worn triangle, Brooksy. Yes, but something new's been added, darling. Mm. Oh, you mean the oversensitive conscience? Mm Mm-hmm. The superfluous member of the triangle doesn't, as a rule, get such consideration. (laughs) Especially from the rival female in the case. I wonder if Miss Dunning's reference to death could be a refined way of hinting at murder. Oh, some women have been known to just turn their backs and let mayhem happen. Oh, oh, now you're being cynical, Angel. No, dear. I've just spent a lot of time in powder rooms. Oh. Well, anyway, our friend has her own answer, and I seem to fit into it. I hope that isn't a refined way of saying, welcome, sucker. Yes, Mr. Valentine, you're in love with me. But I can... I am. He is. It's obvious to everybody. Your every action must show it. Oh, now, just a minute, Oh, Miss don't Dunning. you see? It's the only way. I've got to make Lawrence despise me. Uh, Miss Dunning, I'll admit Mr. Valentine has certain qualities that might arouse jealousy in other men. Thank you. But uh, just why are you going to going to all this trouble? As a stand-in Romeo and potential punching bag for your Lawrence, I'd like to know that, too. Lawrence Putnam isn't an easy man to convince. That's why it must look like the real thing between you and me. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Did you say Putnam? Oh, yes. I suppose you've heard of him. Oh, yeah. Lawrence and Bernice Putnam in deepest Africa, in fabulous Somaliland, in timeless Tibet. (laughs) Lawrence and Bernice Putnam, one of the ideally mated couples of our time, sharing adventure and romance side by side. But he loves me. And for years I've fought against my love for him. But it's there. And, uh, Bernice Putnam? She doesn't know. And she mustn't know, ever. Well, she doesn't sound like the kind of female who'd keel over when she found out her husband had fallen in love with another woman. If she found out, it would mean her death. What? Yeah, you mentioned that in your letter, Miss Dunning. Now, what's it supposed to mean? Bernice's heart. Dr. Llewellyn, the family physician, told Lawrence a few weeks ago just how bad it is. I see. Almost any kind of exertion or shock might mean... Any way you can imagine what would happen if Lawrence told her he wanted to be free to marry me. Uh Uh-huh. And you think that if you and I were seen going places and doing things, people would say we're in love. Especially Lawrence. I am Bernice's best friend. And she needs Lawrence now, even more than I do. Dr. Llewellyn says that if she's to go on living, they've got to go away and settle down in some quiet place. You know, on a farm or a small town. Well, not a very easy change for either one of them. Bernice knows she has to do it, and she's positive Lawrence loves her enough to go along with her. If it's the last thing I do, I've got to make it work out that way. Well, have you tried breaking off with Putnam? Women usually know how to imply. I've tried everything. Lawrence just thinks I'm being noble about Bernice. 
That's why I've got to make him believe there's someone else. Well, now look, this steel, Miss Dunning, it's way out you of my line. You can't turn me down, Mr. Valentine. It means her life. Well, I... You understand, don't you, Miss Brooks? Yes, I believe I do. You're trying to do a pretty decent thing. <sighs> okay, well, how do we work this? Well, tonight, for instance. Yeah? Lawrence is meeting a circus man for dinner at the Croydon. He's selling some of the animals from his last expedition. He keeps them on his estate at Mount Webster. And? Lawrence doesn't think I know about the appointment. So if he saw us there, and we were playing our parts, it might help bring this thing to the head. Convince him that I'm, I'm only thinking of myself. Okay, Miss Dunning, okay. But as I said before, this is something new for me, so I may need a little coaching. But I'll keep Tyrone Power in mind and do my best. <laughs> Everybody else but Putnam seems to be noticing us. When Lawrence gets on the subject of that menagerie he has on his estate, he doesn't notice anything around him. Well, we're certainly playing the romantic couple to the help. Your tiny hand in mine, rapturous glances by candlelight. You know, all we need is a gypsy violinist at our table playing Zagonia. I never thought anything could hurt so much. Oh, I'm sorry, George. Dr. Llewellyn told Lawrence he has to get Bernice away in a matter of days. This has to work. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Don't look over, but I think he spotted us. Uh, darling? Oh. oh, George. We should at least pretend we're interested in all this lovely food. What'll the waiter think? Well, he's had a good look at you, hasn't he? Oh, oh I think he'll forgive me. You are beautiful tonight, George. Oh, if I hadn't told you just a few minutes ago how much I loved you, I'd say it again. Why don't you, George? What? Uh, Lawrence, I... What does one say in a situation like this? What a coincidence or fancy meeting you here? <laughs> oh, uh, Joyce, darling, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Oh, uh, Lawrence, this is... I was just having a most interesting discussion with Mr. Folsom, my guest. But, uh, well, I just had to come over and pay my respects. Well, I, I hardly expected to see you here. But, Lawrence, I did try to tell you before. In so many ways... Great I... animal man, Folsom. We were talking about living in the jungle, which isn't too unlike civilization. Uh, for instance, when you're on a safari, you have to trust whoever is with you, blindly, without reservation. Lawrence. A betrayal of trust is the one thing you can't tolerate. Your well-being, your comfort and happiness, your, your very survival depends on that rather primitive law. So you, you do something about it. <laughs> well, that's a rather grim conversation for such pleasant surroundings. Uh, look, we'd, we'd like to ask you and your friend to join us, but, uh, well, you understand. Perfectly. Good night, Joyce. Oh, but, Lawrence, I... Easy, Joyce, and hold that smile. Yes. Yes, you're right. Well, we put on a nice act, but I doubt if it's the old convincer. It's pretty obvious Putnam isn't letting it go at that. Brooks, I believe? Why, yes, but Mr. Valentine isn't here. I know. I made sure of that. What? I waited uh, till I saw him leave the building. Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand. I'm Lawrence Putman. Oh, yes, of course. I should have recognized you from your picture. Miss Brooks, how much is Joyce Dunning paying Valentine to help her stage this phony romance? What are you talking about? Please, please. I, I've taken the trouble to find out all about Valentine and this... Uh, unorthodox business he's in. What? Yes, yes, and I've also learned that he's not just your boss. He means a great deal more to you than that. I don't see where that's any of your business. Everything about Valentine is my business now. Oh, I'm sorry. George might have meant something to me once, but in the last few weeks all that changed. Oh? I don't know where he met Miss Dunning, but I know he hasn't been the same man since. All he can think of is when he's going to see her next. Well, I don't care what he does now. I have my pride. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe I had this thing lined up wrong at that. All right. You're interested in Valentine. I'm interested in Miss Dunning. Suppose we work together. Oh, I'd be willing to do almost anything. Good. Now, why don't you tell Valentine that I feel very bad about my rudeness at the Croydon last evening? I'd like him and Joyce to spend the weekend at our place on Mount Webster. 
And uh, while I was here, I suggested that you come along, too. Oh, but wouldn't that be rather awkward? Well, why? After all, we don't live in the jungle. We're, we're civilized people, and Mrs. Putnam and Joyce are very close friends. And you and Mr. Valentine both having the same interest. <laughs> yes. Yes, it should be a very pleasant weekend. Come Monday morning, we should all know just where we stand. Bernice, are you sure it isn't too cold for you out here on the terrace? Oh, now, Joyce, you stop pampering me. I have all I can do to put up with Lawrence and Dr. Llewellyn, the old tyrant. Oh, that's hardly fair, Mrs. Putnam. After all, they aren't here to defend themselves. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Putnam, the view from up here is breathtaking. Yes, it is lovely. No matter what forsaken part of the world we might have been in, this was always home. Although some people refer to it as the Putnam Zoo. It's not easy for Lawrence to be giving it all up. Oh? Then he has decided. Yes. He's selling some of the animals to circuses and others to zoos. Then we'll... we'll just be two homebodies. Oh, but this couldn't possibly interest Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Oh, here comes Lawrence and Dr. Llewellyn. Oh, uh, time for your nap, Bernice, and no wheedling out of it. He's right, my dear. Oh, dear, see what I mean by the thin line between thoughtfulness and tyranny? <laughs> <laughs> Come along, Bernice, I'll go with you. Now, Dr. Llewellyn has me billeted in Lawrence's study on the ground floor. I don't have to climb stairs. But whenever I wake up, it's so big, I feel as though I'm sleeping in the middle of a gymnasium. <laughs> I think I'll curl up with a good book while the gentlemen pay tribute to the animal kingdom. Oh, yes, Lawrence. Mr. Valentine made the fatal remark. He'd like to look around. Give him the special dollar tour. I'll do that, Bernice. I uh, think you might learn a lot from this little tour, Valentine. Come along. This way. Okay. Mm. Uh, I could never understand anybody living in the middle of a zoological garden. Not only the infernal noise, but, uh, well, the odors. Say, in that cage, what are those birds? Parakeets, Valentine. Probably the most beautiful ever brought into this country. Oh, this is nothing. On the other side of the hill, he actually has cheetahs, jaguars, and, and, and crocodiles. <laughs> you don't say. Oh, here, here. Here's something for you to see, Valentine. What's that? Here in this big cage, a bird that very few people know anything about. Wow. He's an ugly character. Looks like a buzzard or a vulture. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh. The condor. The killer bird of the Andes. Oh, uh, Juan. Si, sí, senor. Open the cage, Juan. Tomorrow, maybe, senor. Tonight he has very bad temper. He looks harmless enough. <laughs> well, don't let appearances fool you. Those wings can spread more than ten feet. The talons are larger than your hands. <laughs> You know, I've seen how condors lie in wait for a pack train or a herd of cattle. They single one victim out, blind it with their claws, and go at it even before it's dead. Yes, they can eat 18 pounds of meat in one day. Mm, good <laughs> well, the facts you don't learn in a movie travelogue. Huh? Uh, let me have that machete one. Now, this is the only thing as sharp as his talons, Valentine. I, uh... I made him learn to respect it. You must not go in tonight, Senor Putnam. Uh, look here, Lawrence. I, I thought you were going to sell all these things and give up all this nonsense. Hmm? Llewellyn, I'm not the invalid. Oh, yes, but... Uh, Perhaps I... you'd like to join me, Valentine. It'll be an experience. Oh, yeah, sure, I bet. But, uh, frankly, I could live without it. Oh, it'll be quite safe. Now, uh, this condor hates me. But that, that's only because he fears me. You'll be safe. Unless, of course, your taste runs to, uh, parakeets or canaries. Okay, Putnam, I'll play along. As long as you say it's safe. Well, I'll stay here, but, uh, really, Lawrence, you shouldn't have it. Ah, ah. Look at that condor, Valentine. Isn't it a beauty? <coughs> <coughs> He's beginning to spread his wings. Ah, you're up to something, aren't you, you beady-eyed monster? <coughs> Watch him. He's coming at me. He is like the devil. He's coming at me. Hey, put them. Put them. Don't stand there. Wait. Get away from me. All right. Get back. Get this. That's enough. I'll kill you if you weren't worth so much. Hurry, senores. Come out quick. Are you all right, Lawrence? Yeah, yeah. He's all right. And I'm all right, too. 
Ah, you were correct, Putnam. That was an experience. You know, a condor is a strange creature, Valentine. This is his cage, and he resents it when somebody threatens what he's claimed for his own. That was pretty obvious. And he doesn't know what it means to fight clean. You can understand that, can't you? Yes, Putnam, I can. And don't you worry. I'm not going to forget it. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about a summer motoring precaution. If you're planning a trip, better get those worn tires inspected tomorrow at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. That's where you'll find your best value, Atlas Tires. Famous for giving more mileage and safer mileage. Besides having more rubber to grip the road and a road-tested design for safer stops, Atlas Tires give you greater riding comfort, too. And each new Atlas passenger tire is backed by a written warranty. For a whole year, this warranty covers damage to the tire from ordinary road hazards and guarantees the materials and workmanship for the life of the tire. Best of all, your Atlas tire warranty is honored by 38,000 dealers, coast to coast and in Canada. For safer, better driving, go on Atlas tires. And for expert tire care, rely on standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And if you were in George's place, here's the situation you'd be facing. A lady asks you to help break off a hopeless love between her and the husband of her best friend. Pretty corny, you say. But then she explains that the wife has a heart condition. The shock would most certainly kill her. So you pretend to be the man who supplanted the husband in your client's affections. But then there's a thinly veiled threat from the husband. He won't hesitate to kill you if you stand in his way. Still, being as stubborn a character as George Valentine, you play along even though you can't help asking certain questions, such as... Hey, Putnam, isn't this a lot of trouble to climb all the way to the summer house just for a cup of tea? Oh, it'll be worth it, Valentine. From the upper terrace, you can look down and see all the trophies of a lifetime. Birds and animals you've risked your life to find in every corner of the world. Oh, take it easy, Lawrence. It's a steep climb, and there's not that much of a hurry. Uh, Dr. Llewellyn, oh. this has been my whole life. This one last look, before I give it all up, means a great deal to me. Are you all right, Bernice? Yes, dear, fine. Joyce and Miss Brooks said they'd have tea already when we get there. And Joyce promises a special surprise. I wonder what it could be. What's the matter with you people? Tea's getting cold. Yeah, we're coming, Brooksy. <laughs> Set the table up right out here on the porch. Oh, it's beautiful, Joyce. And all these flowers. Why, this must be an occasion. <laughs> it is. Please, Miss Brooks, will you help me serve? Of course. <laughs> I feel like a romantic schoolgirl. Oh? But I know you've already guessed, Bernice. And the rest of you will find out anyway. Yes, Joyce? I'll never know how it really happened. Just what is it that makes two people suddenly realize they're in love, George? You, oh, I suppose you just call it the sweet mystery of life or something like that. What I'm trying to say, everybody, is that... George and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> Lawrence! Uh, just not used to such world-shaking announcements. Sorry. Um, let me be the first to congratulate you both. Oh, thank you, Brooksy. I don't know how much you mean it. Uh, my best wishes, of course. Well, isn't it wonderful, Lawrence? Just the thing we've always wanted for Joyce. Yes. Lawrence, where are you going? What's the matter? Lawrence! Lawrence, you shouldn't have left us like that. Bernice couldn't understand the way you acted. She's back at the house with Dr. Llewellyn. And you find me in the snake house, Joyce. Very appropriate. It seems I have a morbid fascination for things that crawl and are likely to strike without warning. Lawrence, don't. Look, Portland, let's stop kidding each other. I know how you feel about Joyce. She told me. Really? But we love each other. That's the way it turned out. And there's nothing that can be done about it. That's right, Mr. Putnam. I'm a sort of casualty in this little drama, too. Please try to understand, Lawrence. Of course, dear. As long as I'm sure it's the real thing between you and Valentine, I... I'm sorry. Well, let's forget about it, huh? Oh, sure, sure. 
But now you must you must really allow me to play the gracious host. What do you mean, Mr. Putnam? I'm going to show you my rarest prize. I think you ought to go and talk to Bernice. Bernice would want you to see it. The King Cobra. We trapped it together in the Nepal just last year. Oh, how, how nice. The Pale Killer. That's what the natives called it. The color almost white. The only time you could hope to capture it was at night when there was no moon. Uh, he, uh, he's over here in this cage. Come over and take a look at him. You'll never get another chance. They're coming for him first thing in the morning. You know, George, I could skip this. Well, he's playing some kind of a game, Brooksy. I've got to find out what it is. Lawrence, you've showed me that cobra before. You can tell the others about it. Why do we have to look at it tonight? Because it's the best time, my dear. Uh, wait, wait a minute. What's the matter? Why, he's, he's not in there. Or, huh? or is he? Hey, Putnam, close that door. Oh, he's not in there. Juan! Juan! Where are you? Oh, if he let them take him away tonight before I had a chance to see him, I... I... Well, we'll just have to go through life without seeing the pale killer. It's tough, but we'll have to bear up under it. Let's get back to the house, George. Yes, I'm worried about the knee. Let's go. George! What is it? There! He's out of the cage, the cobra! Ah. He's coming toward us! Brooksy, out of the way! Run for the door! Do as I say, Brooksy! He's coming toward me! Now, get back, Joyce. He's raising up the strike. Oh, be careful! Look, stand behind me. I'll try to hold him off of this rake. It's a snap lock. I can't open the door! George, he struck your leg! I've got him pinned down! But, but he bit you! I saw him! George. Keep pounding on that door, Brooksy! Somebody's got to hear us. Get us out of here. Uh, it's about time you showed up, Lawrence. This man might die. Don't just stand there like that. Lawrence, you certainly must have an antidote for something like this. But there's really no need for all this excitement. Why do you think so? Well, but how can you talk like that? Can't you what see? What are you it? saying? I thought I mentioned it, Miss Brooks. We had the poison sacks of that cobra removed. Oh. He'd, oh, he'd be much too dead to have around otherwise. Well, I guess you can stop pampering me now and I can get up. Yes, I'm sorry about this, Valentine. I, I could have sworn the cage was empty. That cobra must have been coiled up in a dark corner. Uh huh. I heard all the commotion in the snake house. When I looked in, I saw you, Valentine, get Miss Brooks out of danger and then go to Joyce's rescue. You saw all that? But why didn't you do something? Yes, Lawrence. As I said, I thought I told you the snake was harmless. I, uh, I did open the door as quickly as I could. Yeah. Oh, thanks. you could have saved us all a lot of worry if you weren't more concerned about getting that cobra back in his cage. <laughs> well, it's all over now, Doctor, and the best thing for all of us would be to turn in. Oh, uh, oh, yes, Doctor. Mm. On the way to my room... Shall I stop in and give Bernice those pills for her heart? Uh, I, I've done that, Lawrence. So she's probably fast asleep. Oh, it's a good thing, too, considering all this excitement. Mr. Putnam, I suppose this little incident should make a chapter in the next book you write. Well, you may have something there, Valentine. It, it was quite an experience. The kind of experience we learn a lot from, whether we realize it or not. <laughs> Okay, Brooksy, when I'm through with my cigarette, we'll get back to the house. It's getting late. George, I'm afraid. Oh, no, no, Angel. Well, he's such a strange man. I can't tell what he might be up to next. Well, one thing you can be sure of, he doesn't believe that gag about me and Joyce anymore. No, he planned that little job in the snake house, and it worked. Oh, I can't explain how I felt, George, when I saw that the only thing you could think of at that moment was me. Putnam saw what he wanted to see, all right. That I wasn't thinking of the woman I was supposed to marry... But of you. Mm -hmm. Well, now that he knows, it doesn't seem much use to go on with this far. And I'm wondering about something else. What, darling? Now that Putman knows that Joyce went to all this trouble of hiring me because she loves him so much, what is he going to do about Bernice? Is he still going to give up Joyce and all the excitement in his life for a quiet place in the country? And Bernice is so sure he loves her enough to do anything for her. Yeah, I know. I don't know. Maybe my brains are parted the wrong way, Brooksy, but I keep feeling that there's something even screwier about this deal. I mean, even more cockeyed than anything that's happened to us today. Oh, it's just a feeling you get around this place. But maybe it was worth it. Huh? What do you mean? Oh, look, you big dope. What makes it so hard for you to say you love me? Much easier than pushing me out of the way of cobras. <laughs> oh, Angel, there are things you don't have to put into words. Now, you know. Well, that's coming from the house. It's Bernice. Oh, and I don't know how he got loose. But that's the condor. Lawrence! Lawrence, don't go so near him. Watch your eyes. Hey, 
thought I taught you to fear me. Bernie, Bernie, get into the closet. So you finally found a way to escape. Lawrence, look out. Don't try to fight him. And your hate even led you right to my room, didn't it? Put them. Put them. Don't be a fool. You can't fight this thing off of the chair. Stay out of my way, Valentine. I've listened to you enough today. This is the only way to handle a killer like this. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. Now I know what a dead condo looks like. Oh, God. Look, go on over and take care of her niece. Yes, George. I'll get Dr. Llewellyn the shot. What in heaven's name is... Yes, what happened? Fortunately, nothing, Joyce. That bird never had the chance to touch him. But Dr. Llewellyn, George, Lawrence, on the floor like that. Huh? Oh, Lawrence, oh, my God. But I told you, the bird never got to him. Bernice, Lawrence is dead. What's that? Oh. He was trying to save me. But how, <laughs> Dr. Llewellyn? Why? Uh, I guess all our deception didn't work, Bernice. Deception? What do you mean, Doctor? Uh, we knew Lawrence would never give up the kind of life he wanted and needed, not for himself. He would do it for Bernice. Dr. Llewellyn. Yes, uh, you see, it was uh, Lawrence whose heart was so bad. <laughs> George, you and I know that what happened was no accident. Putnam wasn't there in that room to save Bernice. That's right, Brooksy. Yeah, he was hoping the shock of waking up in a room with a condor would be enough to finish off his wife. And then he'd be free to marry Joyce. And with no murder charge to worry about. Still, Angel, our record of this case is going to agree exactly with Dr. Llewellyn's heart failure. Well, I guess you're right. It'd be too cruel to tell Bernice or Joyce the real truth. Hey, you know, now I know what that feeling was I had when we were walking back toward the house. Dr. Llewellyn always worried about Putnam overexerting himself, like in the condor cage. That's right, of course. For the sake of appearances, Dr. Llewellyn had Bernice take the room downstairs so she wouldn't have to traipse up and down. But he didn't have anything to say when she climbed all the way up that steep hill for our engagement party. Well, if he was setting a trap for an animal in the jungle, he couldn't have done better than what he had in mind for his wife. Yeah. I suppose there's a certain poetic justice, Angel. The perfect trap... Caught the perfect hunter. Maybe you've run into the kind of motorist who always says, Grease is grease, and it doesn't matter where you take your car for lubrication service. Well, don't you believe him. At independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, they use many specialized grades of RPM greases and oils to give your car a thorough lubrication. And each one is tailor-made to do a wear-saving job at some vital wear point on your car. The regular 1,000-mile grease job at these stations is done by trained experts. They follow a lube chart approved by the manufacturer of your car. And they take pride in doing a spick-and-span clean job for you. Next time your car is due for lubrication service, rely on the standard station or the independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear George saying... Take another look down the highway, Brooksy. What do you see? A pretty highway. Yeah. One lane going east, the other going west. Uh-huh. And an island of trees in the middle. Yeah. Joe Logan left this place and started to walk down the highway on the right-hand side, walking toward the Half Moon Motel, not away from it. Well, if you're right, George, Logan never even got there to kill Potter. Which should simplify things for us, but it doesn't. I've got a hunch whoever killed Potter ran Logan down. And, Brooksy, that's what we've got to find out. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gene Bates as Joyce Dunning, Ted Van Elts as Lawrence Putnam, 
Dorothy Lovett is Bernice Putnam, Herbert Rawlinson is Dr. Llewellyn, and Don Diamond is Juan. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, that was actually a pretty uh, ingenious show. Very different, with a uh, much stronger adventure bait than uh, normal, and they were able to uh, accomplish that um, because of the flexibility of Mr. Valentine's uh, case. Really, it allows them to take on some very unusual cases and gives the writers a lot of uh, liberty, too. Uh, plus, I had to appreciate how... Uh, Lawrence proved that uh, George Valentine wasn't interested in getting married. It was definitely a nice moment for fans. Uh, speaking of fans, I've got this email here from John, um, who says that he switched uh, to us from another podcast, uh, thinking it was superior. Um, the main reason is the added value of your commentary. I also particularly enjoy getting regular episodes of Let George Do It, and uh, my favorite, Johnny Dollar. Uh, my reason for listening to old-time radio is I get a a real kick out of the over-the-top drama and hard-boiled language. It makes me smile. I'm also a, a he's a similar vein. He likes Wild Wild West uh, TV show and also great Gil, uh, Gildersleep and Fibber, uh, McGee and Molly. Uh, the reason for my comment, aside from uh, thanking for producing these great shows, is that a lot of people seem to be suggesting other detectives you ought to include. So I thought I would toss in my two cents. Uh, the two shows I miss most and can't seem to find anywhere else are The New Adventures of Nero Wolf with Cindy Greenstreet and Richard Diamond with Dick Powell. I like those in particular because of the humor in writing. The same kind of humor is found in George and Dollar and in the dialogue of Jocko and Pat Novak. Um, well, uh, thanks for the, the comments. Um, actually, uh, we're going to get to Richard Diamond. It's going to be a bit. Um, but... Uh, uh, Nero Wolf could be quite a bit sooner. I'm considering doing it after we finish uh, Jeff Regan, and then we've got two weeks of uh, Father Brown. Um, uh, it's one of two finalists, so so t- stay tuned on that. Um, and while it will be a while till we get to Richard Diamond, we will get before we get to Richard Diamond, we'll get to Rogues Gallery, which was a similar show, also starring Dick Pat. For my own uh, personal take. I could do without Box 13, and I always delete Sherlock Holmes because they're pretty much humorous. So while I don't expect you to change your format merely on, avi- on my advice, if you ever do decide to rework your lineup, these would be my suggestions. Well, thanks. Um, interesting to hear that on uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but to an extent, I, I definitely uh, I can see where you come from. The humor's a little bit drier on that show, um, and it varies from... Uh, Homes to homes, whether there's uh, any humor at all. Um, Box 13, uh, the one thing I, I, I've thought of, and perhaps the show's great weakness, uh, is the comedic uh, relief part really is supposed to be the relationship with Dan and Susie. Um, and it just doesn't uh, click um, in terms of, it's, not, it's definitely not on the same level of, as Sam Spade and Effie. Um, well, once we do the way we do a show, we basically get the show and we continue from until it's done. So that's why uh, Tuesdays become Johnny Madero and it'll become Jeff Regan, um, and then Monday Box Thirteen uh, after fifty-two weeks, that one's done. So uh, these shows will definitely get worked into the rotation. And now a quick, uh, a couple quick comments on from Facebook.GreatDetectives.net. Uh, you have a great po- from William. You have a great podcast. Your insights and comments added a nice touch to these great shows from the past. Keep up the great work. And then uh, we got this from uh, Chris Adam. Awesome podcast. I listen every day. Thank you for what you do. Well, thank you so much for your comments. And we begin actually with an iTunes review. Uh, uh, this one is from Junie, who writes: I haven't listened to all these shows so far. Just Pat Novak, which I love, just wish so many hadn't been lost. Sherlock Holmes, love the show. Hate the Petri One ads. I mean, I like when the guy's talking to Watson, but please edit out the ads in the middle of shows, and not just for Holmes. Box 13, again, nice. And Johnny Dollar, which I wasn't wild about, but it was still cool. 
I haven't to listened to Let George Do It yet, but I'm planning on doing it uh, soon. I also love the Rathbone Bruce movie. Please put up uh, more of them. Uh, well, thanks for the comments. Uh, we're, we've got actual, uh, of course, I've mentioned that we're going to be doing The Bat um, coming up uh coming up this Sunday, uh, but we are going to do the, Ra uh, we're going to do three more of the Rathbone Bruce movies. Those are the ones that made it into the public domain. Um, in, in terms of the ads in the middle of the show, I, I've kind of gone back and forth on this, and I'm basically at the point of if it, an, if the ads annoy me, that's when I'll pull them. I haven't quite gotten there with the Petri wine, and I know some. Pe uh, I don't know. We we've gotten a, a few more comments in favor than against the Petri wine ads. Um, so until I get to the point of annoyance, uh, we're going to go ahead and keep them in. So, but thanks for the comment, much appreciated, and uh, thanks for your support o over on iTunes. All right. Well, before we get into the show, I do want to let you know. Uh, about Netflix. Uh, for Sherlock Holmes fans, I think Netflix has got to be uh, a top resource. Because uh, as I mentioned, there are four of the Rathbone Bruce uh, Sherlock Holmes movies that are in the uh, public domain. The other ten, um, you can, uh, can actually be ordered. You can watch it. Uh, enjoy it and then send it back or uh, through Netflix. Uh, and you can also enjoy Jeremy Brett's fine BBC uh, version. Uh, Netflix allows you to access the best in Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes movies um, and just be able to get as much Holmes on TV as you'd like. Uh, sign up for Netflix. Uh, you get a couple weeks free. Uh, go to greatdetectives.net, click on the Netflix banner. And now uh, we turn to today's show. This one is called The Unfortunate Tobacconist. And uh, I will go ahead and let you know what's going on in the world because it will be discussed briefly at the end of the show. It's April 30th of 1945. Uh, in Europe, the Allies are closing in. Um, on the uh, Axis powers, and actually uh, on April 30th, uh, this is the same day that Hitler ended his own life um, and really signaled that uh, victory in Europe was at hand. So let's go ahead and we will get into the unfortunate tobacconist, and then we'll come back. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. It began on a, on, a, on a summer evening in 1906. I'd been for a long walk in the park. I remember when I returned to Baker Street and entered our rooms, Holmes looked up at me with a twinkle and, uh, and spoke. You look positively glowing with health, Watson. Well, I had a splendid walk, my dear fellow. You should have come with me. The park was looking particularly beautiful. Well, well chap, during our absence, I've decided to write another monograph. Oh, well, what's the subject this time? Occupational liability to murder. For instance, the mortality rate is naturally high among policemen and detectives. Physicians are murdered with fair regularity, but the murder of a dentist is rare. And who ever heard of a murdered veterinary surgeon? That's quite true, but what's the occasion for this little homily? I've been browsing over my newspaper clippings. Yeah? You recall ever hearing of a murdered tobacconist, Watson? No, no, I can't say that I do. No, I. And yet my clippings inform me that no less than three tobacconists have been murdered in the past six months, and all the murders have occurred... In the same small shop at the east end of London. Now, why do you suppose three tobacconists would be murdered in the same shop? Come now, fellow. Give me a logical solution to the problem, will you? Well, uh, let me see. You say that the shop's in the, in the east end? Yes. Is it near the river? As it happens, it's on the water's edge. Then supposing the tobacconist shop was the headquarters of a smuggling ring. Perhaps boxes of cigars were unloaded from the dock and mm -hmm. brought to the shop. Cigars? Containing pearls or opium or something. Watson, my dear fellow, you're doing splendidly. Oh, you must walk in the park more frequently. You're positively scintillating. Oh, no, no, you're, no, you're making fun of me. I'm sure you're not. You're expecting anyone home? No, no, probably a visitor from Mrs. Hudson. 
Go on with your fascinating theory. Now, why are three tobacconists murdered? Well, because they... They know too much. Perhaps they demand a share in the profits, so the head of the ring decides to kill them. Plausible enough, Watson. I really must congratulate you. I can see that I'm very lucky in having a biographer with such a lively oh, imagination. Thanks very much. Come in. <laughs> imagination. Oh. Oh, hello, Lestrade. Ah, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding. Not here. at all, my dear fellow. Come along, sit down. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Anything uh, remarkable on hand? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Nothing very uh, particular. Ah, then tell me all about it, Mr. <laughs> Can't hide anything from you, can I, sir? Yes, there is something on my mind, and no mistake. And it concerns the three murdered tobacconists, I see. Splendid. Now, how the blazes did you know that? Yes, Holmes, that's pure magic. Not at all, Mary Watson. It's simple deduction. deduction. Observe the five oh, cigars peering out of Lestrade's breast pocket. They are of a far superior quality to his usual brand. Obviously, the scene of his latest investigation has profit certain, well, shall we say, uh, professional perquisites. Am I right, Lestrade? <laughs> of course you are. Careful one, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Lord. my pipe. Well, how about you, Doctor? Oh, thank you, Lestrade. Thank you. Coronas. And now, Inspector, tell me about the murdered tobacconist. How much do you know about the case? Oh, just what I've read in the papers. Well, curiously enough, we were discussing the affair as you walked in, Lestrade. Eh, it's a strange business, gentlemen. I only got hold of the old story today when I had a long talk to young Jack Longworth. Uh, he's the owner of the show. Oh, and in relation to what, Gerald Longworth, the taller member of Parliament who battled so successfully against the slum clearance bill? His son, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's a nice young fellow, too. Uh, when his father died, he inherited this shop along with a lot of other property in the East End. Well, uh, how big a shop is it, Mr. Hyde? Ward sold in the wall, Doctor, like all the other shops in that part of London. The young Mr. Longworth tells me he first rents it to a man by the name of George Grillet. He lives there with his daughter, Lily, and made it quite a nice go out of the shop. Six months ago, when Jack Longworth was abroad, George Grillet has a stroke and nearly kicks the pit. Kicks the, uh, kicks the what? He nearly dies, Doctor. Oh, Fix a bucket. <laughs> and then what happened, Lestrade? <laughs> well, while he's in the hospital, his daughter gives up the lease on the shop. A few days later, an Italian takes it over, and a couple of weeks later, he's found with his float cut. Did you investigate that first murder yourself? No, Miss Holmes. It seemed like any of a dozen killings we get in that part of London. A shopkeeper cut up, his till emptied, no clues. Well, who was the next tenant? A Scotchman. Bloke by the name of Mackintosh. A few weeks after he moved in, the same thing happened to him. That time, I did go down there. But I couldn't find out nothing. Was robbery again the apparent motive? Yes, sir. But the killing one the same. He was strangled with a silk scarf. Silk scarf, eh? And who was the third tenant? The man who was murdered yesterday? A Hindu fella. A man by the name of Mukherjee. He takes it over a week last Friday, and yesterday we find him knife through the back and his money gone. Of course, I was down there eh, before you could say Crystal Palace. But once again, I didn't find out nothing. No knife, no fingerprints on the till, no footprints. Just a very dead Hindu. Was young Mr. Longworth a landlord in England when these murders occurred? Yeah, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Holmes. He docked Tilbury yesterday morning. He didn't know nothing about what had been going on. Well, I imagine he'll have difficulty in renting the shop after three murders. Well, that's just it, Doctor. That's why he comes to me at the yard. George Grillet, his first tenant of the shop, moved back there today with his daughter, Lily. And young Mr. Longworth worried about them. <laughs> well, if you ask me, he's more worried about the daughter than he is about old man Grillet. So the original tenants of the shop are back in residence again, eh? And, um, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, I thought perhaps you'd be interested enough to come along with me and look at the shop, Mr. Evans. I should be very glad to, my dear fellow. Let's go that, Watson. Oh, that's your... Oh, dear, that wretched instrument. I'll answer it. Hello? Mike Grant, how are you? What? Yes. Yes, he... He's here now. Why, of course. I'll do everything I can, certainly. Let's have dinner together soon, shall we? Splendid idea. All right, goodbye. Well, was that your brother home? Yes. Lestrade, I do think you might have told me the whole truth. What do you mean, sir? I thought your visit was prompted by a... Need for friendly assistance. I didn't realize that you came here virtually on a government order. Well, it wasn't just quite like that, Mr. Holmes. What's the government got to do with the case? And how does your brother Mycroft fit into the picture? Not eh? sure yet. 
But of one thing we may be certain, there's obviously a great deal more in this case than Lestrade would have us believe. Why do you say that, Holmes? You must bear in mind, old fellow, that occasionally Mycroft is British government. <laughs> part of London take a walk in on a foggy night, ain't it, gentlemen? <laughs> All our policemen work down here in pairs, you know. Yes, I don't blame them. It's a vile neighborhood. Uh, there's the shop just ahead of us, with a sign hanging out. Hello, hello, there he is again. Oh. See that bearded Hindu skulking off around the corner there? Oh, yeah. He's been haunting the place ever since I came down here. So a bearded Hindu haunts the place, eh? Yes, and yesterday, Holmes, the Hindu proprietor of the shop was murdered. Exactly. Well, here we are. I'll go in first. Press look in place, huh? I'll be at it, Jimmy. That's Lily, George Grit's daughter. Helps him with the shop. Sorry to keep you wet. Oh, Oh, it's you, Inspector Lestrade. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, I brought some gentlemen to see your father. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How do you do, Miss Grit? Uh, how do you do, young lady? Is your dad home? No, Inspector. He won't be in till after dinner. Went down at the docks, he did, to see about some cigar shipments. Mr. Longwax here. If you want to see him, we were just having some tea in the back room. Yes, uh, I'd like these gentlemen to meet him. Jack, come out in the shop, Jack. What is it, Lily? Oh, Inspector Lestrade. And this must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I'm sure. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Longworth? I'm very glad the inspector was able to persuade you to come down here, Mr. Holmes. I'm dreadfully worried about this business, particularly since Lily's father insisted on coming back here. I'm afraid they're in great danger, but I can't make Mr. Grillet see it. Young lady, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Well, of course, Mr. Holmes. Before your father had his stroke, did he receive any threats concerning his occupancy of the shop? Well, if he did, he never told me about him. It wouldn't surprise me. I often told him his biggest enemy is himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think I do, Miss Grillet. When your father had his illness, who decided to give up the lease on the shop? I did. No money was coming in, and, well, it looked like Dad might be an invalid for life. Mm. Of course, I couldn't run the shop by myself. Anyhow, I never did like this part of London. It wasn't the right business for Father. Uh, what was his reaction when you told him... Uh... You've given up the lease. Oh, he was awful angry with me. Said I have a right to do it without asking him. Uh, by the way, uh, we saw that bearded Hindu again as we walked up just now. He's been hanging around ever since we came back here, Inspector. Well, has he actually come into the shop, Miss Grit? No, but he keeps walking by and looking in the window. I'm sure if we both went into the back room or left the shop for a little while, well, he'd come right in. Then I suggest we give him the opportunity he's seeking. Miss Grillet, I wonder if you and Mr. Longworth would mind leaving the shop for a while. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Make your departure rather ostentatious, shall we say, so that he uh, can't help noticing it. Give us half an hour or so and then come back. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going with him, Mr. Rod. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, this is my case. I know, I know, but um, in a situation like this, Watson and I work much better alone. We may have to go a little outside the law, and your presence might embarrass us. <laughs> You'd never think I was a detective, too, would you? Anyway, we'll be back in know. half an hour. <laughs> poor, poor old Estrade. He gets very touchy as the years roll by. Yeah, I blame him. I'm leaving him completely in the dark. Come on, Watson. Behind the counter. No, 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 my oh. dear fellow. Not oh, under it. Not under it, old oh, chap. Oh, we lift oh. the flap. Oh, oh, oh. So. Ah, now I suggest we crouch down behind here. Come on, that's it. Have you got your revolver, Watson? Yes, it's in my pocket. Good. In the meantime, make yourself as comfortable as these cramped quarters will permit. We may have uh, quite a wait ahead of us. Look, look, Holmes. There's the Hindu now. I got you covered with this revolver. Now, my man, what are you doing here? Who? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Just answer my question. I do not speak very good English. From Hindustani, a born sector? Ah, sector high. You from the ayah? 
دیکھنی کوستی ہے تمہارا بھائی ہوم کو حکم دیا تمہارا بھائی تم جا نہیں سکتا بہت اچھا Wish you'd tell me what in thunder's going on, who that man was and why you let him go. He's an investigator from the foreign office, old chap. Given his instructions by my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? Yes, old fellow. When well, my brother fails to tell me all the facts concerning this case, I begin to think these triple murders have far greater ramifications than we ever dreamed of. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. Just about time enough for me to mention that any meal becomes a better meal when you serve it with Petri wine. And say, you'll find that Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne are just made to go with food. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red wine that's bosom pals with any meat or meat dish. Boy, what a flavor. And that Petri Sauterne is the delicate white wine that's just perfect with chicken or with fish. Yes, sir, with food... You just can't beat a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Puzzling case is occupying the attention of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Three murders have taken place in a small tobacconist shop in the east end of London. As we rejoin our story, it's late at night, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, accompanied by Inspector Lestrade, are once again walking toward the ill-fated shop. Well, I don't see that you've accomplished much, Mr. Holmes, except that you just bought me a nice dinner. Oh, I'm making progress, Lestrade. If only by the elimination of obvious suspects. But there's a pattern to this case, and that should give us a clue. Well, how do you mean, Holmes? My dear fellow, consider the obvious motive of these murders, and particularly observe the results they've obtained. Well, the murders are the same in all three killings. Robbery. Oh, no, sir. Not the theft of a few pounds from the till... Blind you to the real motive. Look, 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 look. Here's Miss Grillet now. He's coming out of the shop. Good evening, Miss Grillet. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Is your father home yet? Yes, he is, Mr. Holmes. And I can't tell you how anxious I am for you to talk to him. I'm going to meet Mr. Longwear. He's taken me to the music hall. I should be on just after ten. I hope you'll be able to stay with Dad until then. Well, don't you worry, Miss Grillet. We'll keep an eye on him. Oh, thanks ever so much. Oh, um... Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Miss Grillet? Please don't go into our rooms in the back, will you? I've left things in a frightful mess. I quite understand, Miss Grillet. Well, ta-ta. See you later. Hmm. Let's go into the shop. Who is it? Oh, oh, it's you, Inspector. Yeah, these gentlemen, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, sir? Uh, good evening, uh, good evening. Did you meet young Lily just now? Yes, she uh, told us she was going out to the music hall with Mr. Longworth. Yes. I'm afraid we had quite a set to about that. A uh, very strong-willed girl, Lily, very strong-willed. Am I to assume that uh, you disapprove of your daughter's association with Mr. Longworth? Yes, of course I do. He's a top, he's got of money. Lily's so blind she can't see that he's up to no good. Hmm. I'm pretty sure he's afraid I might find out what's really at the back of these here murders. And what is your theory, sir? Well, I'll tell you this in confidence. Got nothing to back it up, I understand. There's been talk of widening the docks around here. That'd make property values go up, you see, of course. Well, young Longworth's been trying to buy up all the other shops along the waterfront here, but they wouldn't sell. If you ask me, he's had these murders done just to frighten people away so that they, he could buy cheap. Now, I'm not saying that he did the murders himself, you understand, but he planned them. Why, well, in these parts, it's easy enough any night to get a throat cut for a couple of quid. Yeah. That's why I'm glad you're here, gents. You see, I... Uh, I just got another warning. Warning? What do you mean, it's a warning? Found this note slipped under that door there not three quarters of an hour ago. Let me see, please. Huh. What does it say, Holmes? I shall call on you at 8.30 tonight. You know what's good for you. You'll be waiting for me alone. Try any funny tricks, you'll go where I sent the rest of them. Well, that's obviously been the killer. Possibly. What's the time now? Mm, look, it's, uh, very past eight. I uh, was hoping you gentlemen would wait in our rooms back of the shop. You can hear what's going on in here, and if he tries any rough stuff, you can pop in and have him. Just what I was about to suggest myself, Mr. Grillis. Either way, will you? Oh, yes. Just step behind the counter, gents. 
through here. Ah, here we are. Not exactly Buckingham Palace back here. But you can make yourselves comfortable, can't you, gents? Oh, don't you worry about us, Quillen. Oh, I better turn out the gas. This bloke spot the light under the door in here. Might smell a rat. Now, there we are. Now, as soon as I see him coming in the shop, I'll knock twice on the door. Like this. And that'll give you the signal that he's here. Is that right? Right, you are, Grillet. All right, now keep your ears open, gents. I may need your help. Where are you, Holmes? I can't see a thing. Over here, Watson. You know, I've, I've got another theory why Jack Longworth might be at the back of all this. You listening, Holmes? Yes, I'm listening, old fellow. What is your theory? Longworth knows that Grillet doesn't approve of his having anything to do with Lily. So when he goes abroad, he leaves instructions to murder the tobacconists. The assassins don't know about Grillet having a stroke, of course, so they keep murdering the, uh, the wrong fuller. Well, that makes very good sense, Doctor. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Holmes. Holmes. Where are you? That's my silly. He's disappeared. No, I haven't. I was just exploring. There goes the front door. Somebody's coming. We've got to go in. Right, watch him listen. We've got to get in there at once. Open the door. Wait, stop. Never mind that. Get your soldiers into it. Come on. Come help me. Come on. Come on, one more. Poor devil. He's been slashed with a knife. Brillet. Brillet. What, the killer got away? I'm going to... No, no, Lestrade can save your energy. Your murderer lies there. But that's grilly. Of course it is. Search his pockets, Watson. I think you'll find a bloodstained knife. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, good Lord. He has a razor in his pocket. It's covered with blood. You mean to say that he slashed himself? Let's set the handcuffs on him, Lestrade. While he's still play-acting, he may be more difficult to handle when he realizes the game's up. Take your hands off of me! Come on, quick! Come on, here! Hey. Come on! Oh, you're... Oh, you're... Oh, you're... Yeah. Very neat, Lestrade. Yeah. Well, now that I've knocked a wounded man out cold, perhaps you'll tell me what's going on, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I'm completely in the dark, too. Oh, it's very simple, really. Willett has just staged a fake attack on himself. Fool us into believing that... Someone else is the murderer. Yeah, but the threatening note he received. Composed by himself for the occasion. Yes, yeah, but we heard voices. We heard the shop door open. He heard Grit talking to himself. And as for the shop door, that's how he gave himself away. Well, how do you mean, Mr. Holmes? Whenever the shop door opens, there's a bell that jangles. You will notice, uh... So. Oh. Yeah, that's right, there is. There's no bell jangle when we were in the back room. But it got us in there, locked the door on us unobtrusively, and staged his little drama. Yes, but we heard the door creak open and close, Mr. O. The creak of this flap in the counter would sound exactly the same, my dear fellow. Now listen. Yes, but why, Holmes? How did you spot that Grillet was a man? It was obvious from the beginning that since nothing changed about the shop except the ownership, that the attackers were directed against any tobacconist who was not Grillet himself. Of course, his daughter, Lily, obviously knew what was going on. Well, I don't see how you figure that one out, Mr. Holmes. Every remark that she made showed that although she loved her father, she knew his failings. In any case, she gave me the final clue. Well, what clue was that? In very pointedly asking me not to go into the back room of the shop. Of course, she meant the reverse of what she said. I followed her advice when you were explaining your theory to Lestrade. Well, what did you find, Mr. Holmes? Miss Grillet had obligingly left a secret door open, a door leading to a passageway that seemed uh, to go down to the waterfront. We'll examine it more thoroughly in a minute. Yes, but I still don't understand... Let's motive, Holmes. Neither do I, old chap. No, I suspect that from uh, the interest of the foreign office in the case, this shop has been the headquarters of, a, of an espionage ring. I'm afraid the final answer to that question will have to be given by someone else. Oh, who, Holmes? By my uh, elder brother, Mycroft. Humiliating, isn't it, Watson? <laughs> What was the final answer to the question, Dr. Watson? Well, Holmes is right as usual, Mr. Foreman. The shop had been the headquarters of a spy ring operated by Grillet. And many international criminals had been smuggled in England, foreign ships moored up the river. And did Mr. Grillet hang for his crime? No, 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 he didn't, my boy. Before the, he came to trial, he, he had a stroke and 
He died. Probably just as well for his daughter's sake. Oh, his daughter. <laughs> his lovely girl. Did she marry Longworth? <laughs> Indeed she did. As a matter of fact, I, I danced at her wedding. It was a very wonderful wedding reception. <laughs> See, you would have been there yourself, Mr. Foreman. In fact, you'd have liked it very much. They, they served a pretty good wine. <laughs> was it a Petri wine by any chance? Hmm? Oh, well, it was so good and easy it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you mean because Petri wine is the kind of a wine you can't forget. That's exactly what I don't Well, that's mean. because the Petri that's family really mean. knows all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. You see, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And they've been able to hand on down in the family from father to son, from father to son, every bit of their skill and experience. That's why Petri wine is so good today. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take a moment yourself and send for your free recipe calendar. Remember, send to Petri wine. Petri wine, San Francisco 26, San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Doctor, do you feel like giving us a hint about next week's story? Yes, I do. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that happened to Holmes and me in the West End of London. It concerns the death of a famous actor who was portraying the part of an equally famous man, Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. And say, from the news we've had so far today... Maybe by next week at this time, we'll hear some really good news from Europe. I certainly hope so, Mr. Foreman. But let us remember the war won't be over when Germany quits. We've still got to lick Japan. That's going to take a long time. So instead of celebrating when VE Day comes along, let's just strengthen our resolve to support the war more than ever here at home. Keep that war job. Don't leave it till you're released. Keep on buying more and more and more war bonds and, and keep them. Don't turn them in. Help all you can with all home front activities and observe all our wartime regulations such as price ceiling. That's the real way to celebrate a victory in Europe, by working harder to end the war in the Pacific. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce with the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Bill Foreman saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, Dr. Watson is uh, uh, giving out orders uh, for the war. Uh, and you'll hear that on um, those few old-time radio shows that have uh, survived. But Dr. Watson at this point kind of, uh, um, uh, particularly through the way that Petri Wine portrayed this kind of a grandfatherly uh, figure, um, I thought this one was a was a pretty clever plot um, with an interesting premise, and, and they did a good job on it. Um, I did kind of get a little feel of what Junie was talking about with with perhaps the end ad was uh, the Petri Wine theme song. Uh, I don't know how many more weeks uh, I'm going to be uh, lacking that, but I like the applause after the uh, song, so I guess that leaves me uh, uh, leaves us in, on the cusp of a dilemma if we want to to take that uh, to take that out. So um, one thing uh, about the show, because of the ads and the format of the the framing, uh, there's not as much uh, show uh, left to actually work with. 
Uh, like if you take Johnny Dollar, I've got 26, 27 minutes to work with at this point uh, because it's uh, it was a CBS sustain. Um, but uh, the Sherlock Holmes in 1945 with the Petri wine ads really had... Um, uh, th- there was one episode I, I played, I believe it was the um, Superfluous Pearl, uh, that actually didn't have any ads, in the, uh, and it was just the story, no intro, no outro, and it was only about 20 minutes long. So that's kind of a challenge they deal with, and I think they handled it pretty good this week. I don't have a whole lot to talk about in terms of Johnny Dollar. We got some comments after the episode that I think you'll find interesting. Um, but I do want to let you know about the movie coming up on Sunday. It is The Bat, starring Agnes Moorhead and Vincent Price. It's kind of got uh, one of those old house uh, mystery feelings with a little bit of a twist. Um, there's, uh, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. There are some, uh, some, some elements that don't work quite as well. But when you have Moorhead and Price... Um, that that really, I think, lifted the production up on this. Uh, in terms of any parental advisory, there's one um, very mild uh, potential swear, depending on how you look at it, at the uh, start of uh, towards the beginning of the movie. Um, and uh, and there is a little bit of violence, but they're a lot more artful than Hollywood today. So if I were uh, rating it, I'd probably put a PG on it. And so enjoy, and if you have our app, uh, which you can get at if you've got the iPod Touch or iPhone, uh, along with my commentary, I'll be also be giving you a preview of The Saint, a show we're going to end up doing in a few years, but uh, thought since we're playing a Vincent Price movie, uh, have some fun with uh, one of the great uh, detective shows, The Saint. Before we do get started with the show today, I want to remind you, as you make your travel plans, uh, you plan on going out on vacation, or uh, perhaps traveling uh, to uh, enjoy the uh, spring training in baseball, remember the name JohnnyDollarAir.com. JohnnyDollarAir.com is Priceline, which gives you flexibility by allowing you to either name your own price or choose from a wide variety of published specials on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more. So just remember that name, johnnydollarair.com. Well, we're going to get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, This one is called Witness, a witness who's got the witness. Uh, And uh, uh, it's a fun episode. Sound quality is not the best, but uh, let's go ahead. We'll take a listen, and then we'll come back. In this case, most of the principals were out on bail. It put me out on a limb. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Max Kraus, Kraus Bail Bond and Insurance Agency, New York City, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of two of your clients, or witness, witness, who's got the witness? Or, he said, give me liberty or give me debt, and got both. Expense account, item one. One dollar, one cigar, to replace the asphyxiating stogie you were smoking when you arrived, unannounced, at my Hartford apartment door. That is Max Klaus. Here's my car. Klaus Bail Bond Insurance Agency, State, Federal, Immigration. All forms of surety bonds and insurance. Got it. <coughs> I got it. Oh, well, I got a job for you to the tune of saving me $50,000. Okay, okay, you can come in. But you'll have to tie up that cigar outside. What's that? Here, better yet, give it to me. Hey, hey. Hey. Come on in. Hey, what's the idea of throwing it out the window? That was an expensive cigar. Oh, can you think of a better way to get rid of it? It was killing me. Here, 
Have one of these. Hmm? Oh. Ah. Well, not the quality I'm used to, you understand, but uh, much obliged. Forget it. They were a gift. Maybe I won't even charge you for it. If I go to work for you. Well, shall we find out if I will or not? Mm. Sit down. Mm. Um, what do you know about Leo Persina? <laughs> Just what I read in the paper. Did you put up his bail? I wish I had. Well, the bonds I put up were for two prosecution witnesses. Know what I mean? Yeah. They either took a run out, jumped from one of the bridges, or some of Leo's men put them out of the way. You get me? Uh, vaguely. They're gone. Yeah, that's right. And unless I can prove they're dead or find them, you understand, before the trial, which is a week from today, I forfeit the 50000 25 apiece. See my problem? Yeah. Tell me something, Mr. Krauss. Why don't you come to me? Well, I'll tell you why. To the police, these witnesses are only two names on a long list of missing persons. You help with me? Uh-huh, yeah. Now... And as for private detectives, I could never be sure that one wouldn't make a deal with Pacino and make more money not finding them than I'd be paying to find them. Get the point? Yeah. Well, uh, what makes you think you can trust me? Oh, well, you were mentioned by one of the insurance companies I sell for. They tell me that you're straight, except for padding your expenses here and there. Hmm? Hey, now, that's an insult. Ah, what's a little padding? <laughs> I used to do the same with my old man when I was in grade school. That kid stuff. You'll find out. I said uh, I'll find out what I can. Who are these lost, trait or stolen witnesses? <clears throat> Nippy Cochran is one. Real name is Glenn. You hear? Glenn. Yeah. The other is Dan Patterson. I got their addresses next to Ken. You know what I mean? What else do you need? A big fat retainer, about 2,500 bucks. Ah, that's pretty steep. I've only got a grand with me. It just so happens that I'm a grand person to do business with, Mr. Krause. I'll take the thousand. Expense account, item two, three forty five, train fare, Hartford to New York. A high wind and I hit the big city at the same time, four p.m. to be exact. So I set storm canvas and tanked cross town toward eighty first between Madison and Fifth. One of the bits of information that had come with that $1,000 bit of paper was the fact that one of the missing witnesses, Nippy Cochran, had a sister. Stage name, Mona Doyle. She'd been born in Hell's Kitchen, and she'd worked out her own little recipe consisting of brains, beauty, and cheesecake to cook up her own version of heaven on earth, including angels, Broadway type. Two in front of her 81st Street brownstone, a delivery boy was buzzing his way into the building. Not wishing to argue with Mona over the intercom system on the buzzer panel, I waited for the boy to come out. Caught the door before it closed. Thanks, bub. Went in and up to a second floor apartment. My name is Dollar. You don't know me, but uh, I have some news about your brother. Oh? Just a second. I'll let you in. Coming? Thanks. What's this news you have about Nippy? Oh, well, the uh, guy who put up bail for him, Max Krauss, has hired an insurance investigator to look for him. Oh? Well, what am I supposed to do about that? Ask me to sit down. I'm the investigator. Well, you're awfully clever, aren't you? No, I hired a couple of radio writers to work these things out for me. Well, please do sit down. Thank you. Uh, why did you do it this way? Did you think I'd let you in if I knew what you were? Well, lots of people are allergic to what I am. Well, I'm not. That helps. Do you know where your brother is, Miss Doyle? No. No, um, can I fix you a drink? Does that mean that this is the end of our little discussion? Mr. Dollar, I don't know where Nippy is, believe that or not. I haven't seen much of him in the last few years. He doesn't approve of me, and I don't approve of him. But that doesn't make any difference. What does is that if I did know where you could find him, I wouldn't tell you. I don't hate him enough to kill him that way. That way? Are you holding out for a choice? Pape. That was a nasty thing to say. Well, that slap you handed me ought to make us even. Don't you know what would happen if you found Nippy and brought him back? Well, I've heard that Leo Porcina has some quaint habits with people he doesn't want around. Something about wrapping their feet in a concrete block and lowering them into any handy river. 
Uh, but the law will give him protection until after the trial. What difference would that make? Even if Leo were convicted, don't you think he'd leave orders behind to take care of Nick? Well, that could probably be worked out, too. Well, look, I wasn't hired to worry about that. I was hired to find your brother so my client won't lose his money. Well... Oh, this is a lousy way for two people to meet, isn't it? I wish it were different. What's that supposed to mean? I'd, I'd like to ask you again to have a drink with me. That wind has my nerves jumping. And you haven't helped. Be a good guy, won't you? With what she had to back up that invitation, I defy any guy, good or bad, to come up with anything but an acceptance. Unless he was crowded in 70, and had a car double parked outside, and was married to a suspicious wife who was waiting in the car. So, I stayed, and we learned to know one another. Twenty minutes later, we were close friends. I knew it had to end, and it did. The door buzzer sounded, and Mona bounded over to the little button that controlled the lock on the downstairs entrance. Don't be shocked, Johnny. I brush off a lot of my admirers this way. The only thing I admire about you is the act you put on. It's a good one. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. There was one thing I forgot to tell you about my brother. I can hardly wait. I'm all ears. He gave me everything I have. Without him, I'd have none of all this. Is it Nippy who's on his way up here? That isn't what I mean. All Nippy did was introduce me to Leo Porcina. That's who's on his way up. Oh, Yeah. Well, blood may be thicker than water, but where you're concerned, it isn't thicker than champagne with ermine on the side. Hi, Leo. Come on in and see what's on you. Well, what do you know about this? Who's he? Johnny Dollar, an insurance investigator, hired by Krauss to find Nippy. Well, it's interesting. Yes, it is. Oh, boy. What are you going to say for yourself? Not a Harry there said everything there is to say. Except that I'm also looking for the other missing witness, Dan Patterson. Yeah, yeah, I assume that. Very apt, Mr. Dollar, that we should meet this way. Two men interested in the same uh, subject. The subject was more interesting before you came in. I'll ignore that. Natural. What I meant was that I, too, am quite anxious to find Nippy and Patty. Uh, can I mix you a drink, Leo? No, no, leave us alone, Mona. Go in the bedroom. All right, Leo. And close the door, please. Now, uh, man to man, Dollar, how do you propose to go about finding Nippy and Patty? <laughs> what would you suggest, Porcina? Dragging the rivers? Now, see here, Dollar, there's no need to take such a uh, pessimistic view. I realize that an unfriendly press has endowed me with a reputation for violence, but I, I don't deserve it. I hope you aren't bucking to be canonized. <laughs> <laughs> That's a picture, isn't it? St. <laughs> <Saint> Leo Porcina. <laughs> Saint. <laughs> Quite a sense of humor, Dollar. But my motives are honorable. I'm not afraid of the testimony of those two men. I want them back because their disappearance makes it look bad for me. It's the kind of thing that uh, sways public opinion. <laughs> I got nothing against them. I'll believe that when I see the three of you enjoying a nice, friendly game of billiards. Well, have it your own way. I thought we could form a combination, you and me, to find the boys. But a combination's no good if I trust you and you don't trust me. <laughs> Go ahead, Dollar. Bullet through alone. And good luck to you. Thanks, Leo. I've enjoyed your pack of lies no end. <laughs> so I put on my top coat, picked up my hat, and left. He didn't shoot me while I was on the stairs, so by the time I felt the sidewalk underfoot, I also felt fairly safe. But not for long. The chauffeur in a limousine parked at the curb took off his uniform cap and put on a hat with an eye-hiding brim. I looked up at the lighted window of Mona Doyle's apartment and saw Leo's figure just slipping out of sight. As I started down the street, the chauffeur was no longer a chauffeur. At a signal from Leo, he had turned into a man who was following me. I grabbed a cab on Madison. And by the time our zigzag trip to Patterson's address was over, I felt reasonably sure that I was no longer being followed. The hall was 
looked like a mine shaft and smelled worse. Four doors down on the right, I found a number of Patterson's apartments. Come on in. The man who bid me enter was still wearing the hat with the eye-hiding brim. But something new had been added to his right hand. Forty-five caliber. Leo Porcina's chauffeur hadn't followed me to Patterson's address. He beat me there. Close the door. I don't like to ask foolish questions, but what are you doing here? I live here. All right, Dick. Oh, Patterson. Oh, great. I'm looking for you, and the way I do it is to try and get away from you. Look, take the little of your right hand, will you? I want to talk to you. Sure, but not here. Let's go someplace. <laughs> for me, that someplace was out. But before I got there, I had time to pass myself a question. What better place for a missing witness to hide than the employee of the guy he was supposed to testify against? Then I found a hiding place of my own. It was nice and dark, but the only person I was hiding from was me, Johnny Dollar, America's fabulous insurance investigator. Fabulous indeed. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, a battle to the finish. No holds barred as far as words and opinions are concerned. That's only one of the entertaining elements of People's Platform, a Sunday daytime feature on most of these same CBS stations. Attack and defense and attack again. Politicians, labor leaders, statesmen, farm leaders, men and women from all walks of life find themselves going from the frying pan into the fire many times in each Sunday half-hour session. You'll enjoy People's Platform every Sunday on CBS. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. When my brain started to trip back from unconsciousness, I thought at first I had passed out in one of the tunnels. The air, what there was of it, was thick with the smell of burned gasoline. It was still dark, and it seemed like cars were going past me without headlights. Then I noticed that the tunnel was moving. It took me a long time to figure out that meant it wasn't a tunnel. It was a car, and I was on the floor in the back seat with a blanket covering me. It took two hands and all my strength, but I managed to lift the blanket away from my face. The first thing I saw was one of those old-fashioned speaking tubes that sometimes are used between a limousine's rear and driver's seat. It was hanging down, the mouthpiece a few inches from my head. But what was coming out of it was not noise, but that smell of burned gasoline, carbon monoxide. I didn't have to try them to know that all the doors were locked from the outside and that all the glass was unbreakable. From there, it took me only one short mental step to realize that speaking tube was connected to the exhaust pipe. And I was in the process of being executed in laughing Leo Porcina's private gas chamber. There's nothing so exhilarating as being slapped in the face with death. I wrestled a handkerchief out of my breast pocket, twisted it up into a stopper, jammed it into the tube, and clamped my hand over the mouthpiece. It didn't help the air any, but at least it wasn't getting any worse. Then I settled back to wait, trying not to breathe. Chauffeur, leg man, executioner, Dan Patterson. Opened the rear door. Somebody came to a stop, waited a few seconds for the wind to clear out the fumes, then reached in, grabbed me under the shoulders, and dragged me out. I managed to stay limp until we got a few yards off the road and into, into the brush. Then I dug my heels in and he... It was surprise more than strength that toppled him, but it was no time for nicety. I picked up a handy rock and bashed him one on the head. Ooh. Oh, oh, come on, Danny boy. Uh-huh. Get with it. You'll catch your death of coal lying on this damp ground. Oh, oh. oh. 
dollar. Yeah, a dollar, which uh, probably makes you feel like two cents. Listen, I couldn't help what I did. Well, Leo, it's either do what he tells you to or get it done to you. I'll uh, say that uh, bitch for the jury, will you? I want some answers. Uh, First, where are we? In New Jersey, about 40 minutes south from the city. Listen, give me a break. I'll, I'll help you all I can. I know to break your head. Uh, and save your time and effort. There's nothing in that shoulder holster your hand is moving for. Uh, I've got it. Now, do I use it or do you tell me where Nippy Cochran is? I don't know. I swear I don't. you got to believe that. If I knew, I'd sell the information to Leo for plenty. He walks him bad. Yeah, dream boy. I'll just bet you would. Okay, get up. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Wait, what, what are you going to do? I was hired to find you, and I found you. And now I'm going to put you away where you'll cheat. Come on. Get up. Listen, maybe I do know where Nippy is. Why don't you and me? Patterson, I'll have to stop you. I didn't want to fire, but I had to, and fast in the darkness. Aim was next to impossible, but I shot low. I guess it takes more lead than I threw into him to kill a guy who's so full of mental poison. Patterson was alive when I got to him, and alive and conscious when I left him in the hands of the nearest police doctor. Door, one up. One witness found, and one still missing. Expense account, item four, 50 cents. Toll paid to get Leo Corsina's lethal limousine across the George Washington Bridge and back into New York City. Expense account item five, five cents. Phone call soon after I got there. Yeah? This is Dollar. Let me speak to Leo. Oh, Johnny. Yeah, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm alive and almost well. Johnny, I don't know what you mean, and I don't care what you think of me. You've got to help me. With what? Nailing my casket together? Nippy's in town. He killed Leo. Oh? Well, if it's true, that's a switch. All over the country, defendants are knocking off witnesses, but when I show up, the witness knocks off a defendant. I repeat, if true. It is true. I was with Leo. We, we went from here to his apartment. Nippy came in with a knife. And... you got to help me. I don't know what to do. Well, it's generally a good idea to call the police. Did you? Are you crazy? Probably. Where is Leo's apartment? Do you have to go over there? Well, why not? All right. Pick me up here. I'll pick you over. Goodbye. Whether she was asking me or telling me, she was right. I must be crazy. I gave myself ten to one odds that my journey would end in a trap. But I've been wrong before. Leo Porcina was in his apartment all right, ungracefully spread out on the floor in front of a not-quite-clean white leather chair. There he is. What are you going to do? Knife wound. Left side of chest. No signs of struggle. Where were you? I was in the other room. You didn't see it happen? No. I, I hardly heard anything. I, I didn't even hear Nippy come in. The, the radio was on. I heard a mumble of voices that didn't mean anything. And then Leo screamed, Nippy. I ran in there and Leo was just falling and Nippy was watching him go down and... I wish I knew whether you were bawling because you're grief-stricken or because you're scared. I wish I knew a lot of things about you. Now, come on. Let's go back to your place. And maybe I can find out. Here you are. Johnny Walker for Johnny Dollar. Oh, thanks. Would you also say it's Johnny on the spot? I don't know why I thought I had the right to ask you to help me. Well, I didn't have anyone else to turn to. Oh, you ought to improve your dialogue. I'm not trying to be clever, Johnny. I'm petrified. Nippy knows I saw him. I, I'm the only one that saw him. If you could just stay with me until I could get out of town until this... Until this is cleared up. If I could keep my eyes closed, I'd say you weren't worth it. What you're trying to tell me is that you're afraid Nippy will show up with his dandy little carving set and go to work on you, is that it? It's an awful thing to say about my own brother, but that's right. I'm afraid he'll kill me. He hates me. He blamed me when Leo kicked him out of the combination. Was he right? Of course not. But I couldn't make him believe me. He swore he'd pay us off. He did. He sold the information that got Leo indicted, and now he's killed him. You know, that's an interesting point that he'd go to all the trouble to turn state's witness against Leo and then kill him. 
Why would he do that? To... I don't know. What you started to say was to make it look as though you killed him, wasn't it? Yes. He'd do anything to hurt me. John, if you only knew... Hold it, hold it. Never mind the dust in my eyes, gorgeous. To frame you, Nippy would have to supply you with a motive. Unless you already had one kicking around someplace. And your silence says you probably have. Johnny. Leo was nailed on tax evasion because it turned out that he had undeclared income deposited in various banks under various people's names. How much is in your account? Yes, ma'am. Not very. It doesn't take a wizard to add two and two and come up with a motive. With Leo out of the way, there's very little chance that you will be dragged into court as an accomplice. And I'll mention in passing the bank balance you didn't deny having. I, I know it looks bad, Johnny. Please put your thing <sighs> Why not, Miss Empty? I know it looks bad. I, I'd be in big trouble if the police found out about the account. But did he have to? Johnny. According to all the rules, yeah. I didn't kill him, Johnny. You've got to believe it. I'd like to. You've got to, darling. Don't you think it'd be worth it? There's the money. There's me. Darling. Oh, John. Get away what? from me! What? Tell me what's wrong. In this case, everything. I've been slugged and gassed. I'd have shoot a man. I missed my dinner. But the worst of all is you. You think because you've got your kind of hair and your kind of eyes and mouth and the rest of it, you can hide all your lies and greedy ideas behind them and put a leash on any man you see. Well, that might work with a human being, but I'm not human. I'm an insurance investigator. What are you going to do? I'm going to turn you in for murder. That's what I'm going to do. Operator, operator, get on this thing before I change my mind. Mona didn't really turn on the tears until two men from Homicide took her and tucked her into a squad car. And I didn't warm up to my story until the press arrived. In print, in a very early morning edition that hit the stands at 12.01 a.m., it looked even better than it had sounded. Headline, Insurance Investigator Records Confession of Murderess. Lead. Police, late last night, booked Mona Doyle for the murder of Leo Porcina, racket boss. In an exclusive statement, Johnny Dollar, Hartford, said he was able to record the voluntary confession of the shapely knife killer by means of a tape recorder and a microphone concealed beneath a sofa, thus lifting the suspicion from her brother, Glenn Nippy Cochran, who has been sought for the slaying. The wind was dying, and so was I by the time I got back to my hotel. After making one stop at an all-night drugstore for expense account item seven, dollar uh, seventy-nine adhesive tape, which might be classified as an odd item, since I didn't, as yet, have any broken bones. In my hotel room, I put the tape in the two telephone books, one classified, one general, to what I hoped would be good use. Slipped on a dressing gown and sat down to wait. An hour and ten minutes later, it turned out that I'd waited long enough. Uh, yes? Who is it? A telegram. Well, you can't say much for his originality. Wait a second. I'll slip on a robe. Okay, Dollar, get back in the room. This is hardly the way to deliver a telegram, is it? I've got a message for you, all right, but it's not in an envelope. I'm Nippy Cochran. Well, hello, Nippy Cochran. Confession you coax out of my sister isn't worth the tape is recorded on its phony. The police seem to like it. And nuts, I kill the old porky now. Oh, that's your story, and it could be phony. Look, I'll tell you why the police like Mona's better. Huh? Leo died from a knife wound in the left part of his chest. There were no signs of a struggle. That means he was probably killed by somebody who just walked up to him and pushed. Someone he trusted, a friend. That doesn't fit you, but it fits your sister. I've got the answer to that. It says in the paper that confession of hers lifted the finger off me. The least I can do is take it off her. And you know how that's done. It's a little late for guesswork, Nippy. I'll be killing the same way with the same knife while she's alibied by the police saddle clear. What's it going to do to you? And if you get close to me, you can believe me. There's going to be signs of struggle this time. I don't have to get close to you. The knife came from the usual place in his collar behind his head. His aim was perfect. I felt the shock just over my heart. But the telephone books I taped to my chest called his number. 
The knife bounced off, and Nippy stood there with his mouth hanging open. Then I found something to throw. Something I could aim just generally. A chair. He stumbled back from the impact, and before he could collect his wits or his balance, I let him have a barrage. I should have known. A bail bondsman doesn't know the right people. Expense account item eight. Fifteen dollars. Doctor fee. If it wasn't worth it to you, it was worth it to me to get that adhesive tape off by using alcohol instead of violence. Uh, expense account item nine. Twenty-eight fifty. Replacement of hotel room furniture broken in final brawl. And expense account item 10, if you don't mind, $367.25. See enclosed bar, cafe, and theater receipts. Buying my way back into the favor of the magnificent Mona. Oh, and you may ask me how I was clever enough to know that she was innocent all that time. I didn't. But I could hope, couldn't I? Um, expense account total, original retainer, not returnable, $500.71. Signed, yours, um, truly, Johnny Walker. I mean, dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Ed Max, Paul Dubov, Sidney Miller, Jim Nusser, and Georgia Ellis. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. It's fascinating, it's challenging, it's something unusual in radio fair. Yes, that's what folks are saying about CBS's popular Sunday program, Invitation to Learning. You'll renew old acquaintances in literature, you'll make some exciting new ones when you make a Sunday afternoon listening habit of CBS's Invitation to Learning. Remember the time every Sunday afternoon over most of these CBS stations. They tune now for Von Monroe and his caravan. They follow immediately over most of these CBS stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, this was a cute episode, I, I, I thought. Uh, I love that part where he was talking to her and she complimented him on his cleverness and he uh, he said he paid radio writers uh, to, to help bring about that result. The bail bondsman learned the hard way why, um, or how much it costs to employ America's fabulous uh, fr freelance insurance investigator. Uh, and I think the whole thing though worked out very well. Um, so in a, some fun writing here with some playing with the fourth wall. Well, I got a review on iTunes. A uh, review says, "Comment, love these shows. I'm so grateful to Adam Graham for taking the time to release all these great shows of us for those who, who never had old time radio access. Each show has its own special flavor. I love them all and plowed through them in no flat time flat and can't wait for the next ones. My personal favorite is Patsy Novak because of the writing. It is wonderful and I can't wait to hear his next turn of phrase that will crack me up. His drunken doctor sidekick is genius too. Every episode is worth hearing. Well, thanks. I definitely will miss uh, Pat Novak, though. That has to be the one that I've gotten the most uh, individual uh, comments on is Pat Novak. But uh, it was definitely fun. And hopefully they'll find some of the lost episodes from either San Francisco, which is unlikely, or from the National ABC run. All right, and we have an email from uh, Jeffrey. 
uh, who says that he enjoys the program very much and has taken the survey and voted at Podcast Alley. Well, thanks. You're all covered, particularly for the month of February. Uh, just I w- thought I would bring your t- uh, attention to a compendium that I enjoy. You may already be aware uh, or have this. It is entitled On the Air, The Encyclopedia of Old Time Radio by John Dunning. Excellent resource. Um, yeah, I, I've actually, I don't own it. I have stumbled through it um, because of the Google book search. Uh, they, they do previews of books, and so certain parts of Dunning will be available as I'm researching shows. It gives a little bit of information on a lot of shows. I tend to be somebody who just goes in depth and wants to learn everything I can about um, each uh, single show that I, I learn about. But speciali- specialization. Um, I just bought Who is Johnny Dollar from uh, Bear Manor uh, Media, Volume One, um, and I'm waiting for I'm waiting for that one to uh, uh, to arrive. Uh, it it will have a, a detailed index uh, cataloging each story, case location, and the cast of each program all the way up through the John Lunn episode. So um, I'll be getting that. I find the um, on the air helpful, mainly when I'm looking for a show that may not have a whole lot of um, um, a whole lot of episodes actually out there that you can listen to. Um, really, on the air is uh, the only um, verification, uh, you know, for sure that you can really have any basis on of uh, of Basil Rathbone's other detective show. He actually did a a detective show where he played an inspector from Scotland Yard called uh, Scotland Yard, Uh, but there are no episodes actually in circulation. That's one of the ones I'd definitely like to hear, but thanks for the recommendation. And I see... um, uh, I I see a comment here from Jesse, uh, who writes from Baltimore, I said, I heard the comment about theme music. If you're looking for some good theme music, then take a listen to The Lives of Harry Lyme. It's great. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, took a, I took a listen. The theme music is, pr- is fairly interesting. They use the movie theme from The Third Man, and then they, they play a little tune on a zither. Um, and it's the first time I'm aware of a zither being used as the major uh, component in a theme, but it did seem to work. And two quick comments. Uh, best of the classic radio podcast. Lots of good commentary. A willingness of the moderator to learn. And few ads, but they are of value. And another one, Bailey was great as dollar. And I definitely agree with that. All right, well, we're going to wrap it up. Got any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. Podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.